Okay, so we'll begin at 10.35 then, sir. Yeah, okay. Good. It has come to 30 now. Yeah, yes. Good. Excellent. With the academics opening up, you will have seen that yes, there will yeah, be more yeah. participation. Otherwise, with the pandemic, yeah, yeah. So people are uh, here and there. The connectivity has to be there. Hmm. Thirty-nine students getting admission is a good uh, sign. Yeah. Aye, it's, it's an excellent development. Yes. Even Kannada chemistry, they said uh, they have uh, this in the They have put in some thirty or something like that. Thirty, thirty plus. Oh, good. good. I think uh, now I think uh, students are just getting more uh, inclined towards ge geoscience now. Yes, the responsibility for us, uh, I think, it increases to create uh, venues. Yeah, yeah, and uh, employment opportunities. And collectively, we should be able to be a good uh, to that. Actually, we have an intake of uh, 40 students. Mm -hmm. Forty students. This year is forty, is it? Yeah. So it, it is two years course or three years course. Hello, am I, am I audible, sir? Yes, loud and Hello. clear. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting so many requests all at a time. Uh, it is, it, I think my system is hanging. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. if, if, excuse me, if I, if I suddenly get... Uh, you know, yeah, out. I can understand, I can understand. Yeah. Oh. I think I can admit only maximum 100. Uh, I can't go beyond that. Yeah. Yeah, I think Google Meet doesn't uh, the thing allow more than 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, even for institutes uh, subscription, they have reduced it to 100 only. 100 only. Oh, sure. In future, if it happens, then we have to migrate to Zoom. That is a paid version. Doesn't have any... No, yeah, the paid version would, doesn't uh, have. 250. Uh, Zoom would be better. Yeah. Zoom is a better option. Uh, uh, but it is very costly. Yeah, it is costly. It is expensive. The subscription rate is very high for that. Collaboratively, we can buy one. I think uh, we uh, we can run three three universities right now. We have Manipal, yourself, and Karnataka. Okay, let's pull in and then buy one uh, thing, and uh, we can keep on uh, the sentence uh, rotating it. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Because we require only one login, one username, and one login. So that that is one good option. Yes. So any three institutes can simultaneously, or you know, like uh, whenever they want, they can. Correct.
Yes, yes. Now we shall begin. Yes, sir. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'm ready. Hello. Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Yes. Hello. Yes, yes. Loud and clear. So I uh, will begin the session then. Okay. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a very good morning to all. Very good morning, uh, participants, I would request you to mute your uh, microphones. Uh, please do mute your microphones, participants. Uh, there is a lot of disturbance. Okay, so good morning all. It gives me an immense uh, pleasure to welcome you all to today's uh, webinar on fundamentals of oil and gas exploration, changing landscape of tools, technology and techniques. Today's webinar is organized by the Geolimini and uh, Department of Studies in Geology at the Canadian University of Harvard in collaboration with uh, the Core Research and Exploration Group of the Department of Geology, Central University of Kerala. Before we begin the session, I would like to give a quick background of uh, today's event. The Geo Alumni Association of Karnataka University, Dharwad, has been conducting a webinar series for the past couple of months under the banner of the 21st Century Geoscience Webinar Series. And similarly, the Ore Research and Exploration Group of Department of Geology, Central University of Kerala, had conducted a webinar series on resource exploration under the banner of exploration in the months of October, November 2020. Mr. Srinivas Mokashi, sir, our uh, today's resource person, had delivered a talk on oil and natural gas formation and its exploration during the third webinar of exploration conducted by my lab, Core Research and Exploration Group of COK. The talk was very thoughtful and was appreciated by many participants. In the talk, Mokashi, sir, had assured that uh, participants, uh, they, they will have one more session, sir, will conduct one more session covering the advanced topics and probably involve them activities too. Uh, we had decided that we shall conduct the second session someday after Diwali, but the dates were not fixed yet, uh, fixed then. And uh, I had initially planned to conduct exploration only up to the month of November 2020. So unfortunately or fortunately, we could not organize the second session uh, before November uh, 2020. However, a couple of weeks ago, Mokashi sir just proposed why don't we conduct their second session, which was in balance, uh, in a collaborative manner between the Geo Alumni Association and uh, uh, our lab for research and exploration group. And uh, I, I was very much excited uh, after hearing that. And uh, at the very end, I said yes. So now, as a result, we are gathered here uh, once again uh, to experience a wonderful journey into understanding the fundamentals of oil and gas exploration by Mokashi sir. I hope today's talk benefits a lot to the younger generation of geoscientists, especially the student community who are willing to take up a career in the field of mineral or oil exploration. As I was just telling uh, before this uh, introduction, uh, some of our students who have joined uh, uh, this year, this academic year, just a week ago, so for them this will be the first class of mine, uh, uh, which is uh, directly uh, held by a professional uh, uh, geoscientist. So I am, I am very much excited for this uh, talk and as well, I believe the students are also uh, uh, share the same experience as mine. So without uh, taking much time, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Palakshi Karajgi, sir, to introduce our today's speaker to the audience. And before I hand it over uh, to Karajgi, sir, I must say Palakshi Karajgi, sir, is also a senior member of Karnataka University Geo Alumni and has served as uh, head exploration in Reliance Industries, oil and gas. He's a regular participant in the uh, in all the webinar events conducted by my lab and uh, has given thoughtful, thought-provoking inputs and suggestions during my core deliberation. I thank Kajgi sir for his constant support uh, to my lab initiatives, and I welcome him to take over the session to introduce our today's speaker. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chandan. Please. And uh, good morning to all. I welcome you all for this today's webinar. And uh, we are very lucky to have Mr. Mukashi Srinivas, who is a very distinguished person in the oil industry, to deliver this talk. Srinivas is an alumni of Bangalore University, Karnataka University, and the premier institute ISCM Dhanabad. So he did his BSc from Bangalore, MSc from Karnataka, and MTech from MTech in Petroleum Exploration from Dhanabad. 
and he has a very distinguished academic uh, career. He got gold medal in both BSc and MSc. Later on, he joined ONGC. Then he moved on to this Scottish oil exploration company called Cairn Energy. Now it is Vedanta. Then finally, he moved on to British Petroleum. It is in UK. So he has seen a lot of uh, exploration activities around the world. When he was in ONGC, he has worked in various basins like uh, Krishna, Godavari, Assam, and Mumbai offshore. And he was a team member, task force member of an, uh, deep water exploration in both East Coast and West Coast of India, which ONGC did in a very large scale. He visited many countries as a government, as a part of the government delegation. And he was awarded a very distinguished award in ONGC as an young executive of the year. And he has a lot of discoveries of oil and gas to his credit. In Rajasthan, a Barmer Basin, he has found out a oil field called Tukaram. And in Sri Lanka, deep water offshore areas, he has made two gas discoveries. And later on in British Petroleum in UK, he has seen almost all the continents. He has seen the data and has worked there, in, especially in Africa, Atlantic margins, Asia Pacific, Gulf of Mexico, North Sea, China Sea, all the areas he has seen. And he has developed even, he is very good at even developing softwares also. It's a very rare for the geologist's fraternity. But he has a hands on experience with all those things. He has developed a basin modeling uh, software. It is nothing but you will model all the parameters to find out whether oil and gas is going to be there in the basin or not, including all your uh, all the seismics and uh, well log in uh, inputs. And it is being used in the industry as on today basis. He is a part of technical committee in with American Association of Petroleum Geologists. It's a very premier uh, institute and. He has also involved with the industry, academia, research collaborations, especially with the University of Texas, Cambridge, and Kiel. And he has a lot of publications, both in national and international journals. And we are very lucky to have Mukashi Srinivasith today to deliver this very important talk. And especially the freshers who have just taken up geology course. I think it is a very head-on start for them. And we wish them all the best. And while in, in the meantime, our time afterwards, always you can raise your uh, questions through the uh, water communication facility we have. We'll come back and we'll uh, try to meet your requirements, however small and however big it will be. With this, I hand over the mic to the dais to Mr. Mukashi Srinivas. Srinivas, please. Oh, thank you, Palakshi. Uh, Palakshi and myself, uh, we share a long association of more than 35 years, I think, now in the yeah. industry. Uh, so I think um, he knows me in and out. So thank you very much for introducing me. I'm not that uh, the thing, that an expert, but still I'm a worker, and I uh, I try to uh, improve upon myself year on year. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, uh, my name is M S Srinivas. People also I'm also known by Srin by name Srinivas Mukashi in British Petroleum. So that is the name I st stick to. Um, and today we'll be uh, discussing about fundamentals of oil and natural gas uh, exploration. Uh, I understand that we have a lot of youngsters today who have just taken up um, masters of uh, masters in geology subject. So welcome you all to this subject, a wonderful subject of geology, and um, and oil industry. Okay, so feel free, just listen. I will try to make it further basic because I thought probably I, I should add on something a bit technical. So uh, looking into the aspect that there are new joinees into the webinar, I will try to keep it as simple as possible. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask me. Okay, I'll be able to answer them. Thank you very much. So let's quickly start running through the topic. So but just uh, in the beginning, I, I thought I should always like it is, a, it is a standard practice for me and as well as the industry to have a safety brief. So make sure that you are safe. In case of emergency, you should know how to exit and go to a safe place. Okay. And your responsibility is I'll just say that ask me questions anytime you want. Stop me if you feel that you're not able to follow me and ask for clarification. And also, if you want to have uh, the same further conversation, 
after the webinar, you can always contact me at my email. So today's content, what we'll be discussing is about a little bit of history of oil and gas and how the search for oil starts. And also with the search of oil starting world over, how the technology emerges, okay? And how the technology has been changing with the technology, how we are the, same, the oil industry started developing tools and uh, the techniques in search of oil and uh, uh, finding more oil and uh, gas, okay? And, um, and then I, I want to just run through what exactly is this ENP business all about? Means ENP is like exploration and production. So uh, a geologist, when he gets into an oil, oil company, so his job will be in either in exploration or uh, developing a particular field. So what is this all about? How, how it works? So I just want to give an introduction or just um, a hands-on, a feel about that. Uh, so it's the same thing, like what is exploration, how uh, uh, in exploration the well is drilled, how it is appraised, how a field development takes place, and how we produce oil. So these are all aspects we'll be touching today. But taking back in history, so I think um, the, the people knew about uh, oil seepages, and also they knew to use about bitumen, or you can say tar, or it is asphalt, even uh, um, as long back as 40,000 40, years. Okay? Because uh, that has come up from uh, the Neanderthal site in Syria, where there were some discoveries which showed that the stone tools had bitumen coated on top of them. So it is an assumption, or you can say that based on that fact that people 40,000 years back also knew about use of bitumen. It's Maybe it was for a lubricating, or uh, we, we do not know exactly. And the next one comes is from the uh, Mehargar in India itself, in Indus Valley Civilization, where we find waterproofing of the crop baskets, where uh, this wheat and uh, rice and stuff like that uh, food grains were stored, they were all coated with vitamin. So to make them waterproof and um, uh, seal the uh, cracks or uh, the holes in them. And the Greek historian also, okay, Herodotus, he had mentioned about the Babylon civilization and how the, the vitamin was used or asphalt was used for construction of towers or buildings some 2000 years back. And even today, around that Babylon civilization at Hila, in um, uh, Iraq, we find uh, uh, some seeps, natural seeps still occurring there. So, so that it in fact it connects to that uh, whatever the Greek historian had mentioned about uh, usage. And we all mostly know, I think, world over, everybody has known about Egyptian using bitumen for preparation of their mummies, and and the ancient Greeks and Rome uh, Romans they knew about natural gas flaring which was happening around Azerbaijan, and. The, the drilling about of well oil wells or stuff like that, I think it is the earliest noted or um, uh, known fact is from China. Though it was not meant for drilling for oil well, oil, it was for um, uh, drilling for water that was salt water from which they were evaporating and taking out the salt in the salt um, uh, scarcity areas. And oil was coming along with the water. So that was the first known uh, information we have about. Uh, um, wells which uh, uh, through which oil was flowing. And then uh, in the 10th century, Al Masudi, an Arab, Arabic geographer, has clearly mentioned about oil ships occurring in a number of countries, and that includes even India. And uh, Yaqat Hamavi, um, in the 12th century, in his book, uh, writes about Baku, okay, and in Azerbaijan, as one of the wealthiest Muslim cities where they were trading. Okay, asphalt. Okay, and they were earning a lot of money. It was about some 2000 uh, silver dirhams or something like that. And he says that during those period, Baku was one of the wealthiest uh, cities. And the first real incidence of usage of asphalt comes from a British sailor, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, who had gone to West Indies and his ship was battered. Okay, he used asphalt, okay, to just uh, caulking the um, uh, ship and he mentions about a big lake of the speech lake occurrence in west indies around trinidad and coming now next to uh, the, this is a picture of a sperm whale if you look at the scale you can see the, the, the people around it so at least uh, around um, how many uh, an eight uh, around eight people around and that is the size of this sperm whale and this is a very recent picture wherein that this particular whale had washed ashore and they had um, this, when they opened the stomach, they could find a lot of plastics from there, a slipper, 
and and plastic bottles coming out of that and there was a big hue and cry about environmental issue which is killing the seal earth in this sperm whales okay and if you look at the history okay in fact we can say that the oil was in fact a savior for uh, these whales why that was so well, let's discuss about that the industrial revolution which was taking place when it started in europe the coal was the fundamental uh, uh, energy which was dominating all sort all other energies okay the only oil which was used during the early industrial revolution was a whale oil okay and it was not rock oil or petroleum what we know about this this whale oil was used in lot many uh, applications like for heating lubrication soap textile candle wax lamp oil and so on so on. so that's why there was a lot of demand for whale oil and and a single whale sperm could hold as much as 3 tons of uh, oil and that is the reason around 1775 all around new york the, there was a production of around 45000 barrels of sperm oil every year and that that accounted to around 2200 whales being killed okay and caught and killed and there were about 735 ships doing this business and by 1820 okay united states was in fact was forced to import additional oil because industrial revolution taking place there was a lot of demand and imagine so uh, uh, there were an estimated 236000 whales were killed in the 19th century alone in um, by american whalers and the price of this it has reached um, quite high and um, by the i think uh, close to the american civil war okay and that made the whale cost around 3400 per whale if you catch a whale you are you are going to make around 3400 dollars okay and that is about 85000 um, dollars current day dollars which if you try to convert it to indian rupees it is around 60 lakhs or 70 lakhs we can say about that so if you catch a whale you get okay take out a ship go into the sea catch a whale sperm whale and you make money of 60 lakh or 70 lakhs is it not a profitable business anybody will just dive into sea and try to catch it and that was the, the activity which was happening there in the early 19th century till the mid of early 19th century and the canadian um, uh, uh, scientist by name abraham gesner he found out that they can generate liquid from coal bitumen and shale oil okay so when he heated them so he could get a lighter liquid lighter color liquid which was known as kerosene okay and that was burning very very efficiently and it was less expensive okay and that was a discovery okay that so soon after that he started his own company like a kerosene gas light company and he started uh, this thing, uh, selling it for lighting the streets parallelly in europe there was a polish pharmacist ignacy lukasevich who who understanding about gesner work he refined that particular technology and he started um, slightly tweaking the technology he started generating kerosene okay from sea petroleum means wherever there are ships he was collecting the crude oil and he was refining it and he he was so successful he started his first um, uh, refinery in fact okay so that is how the refinery the first refinery was uh, the uh, given birth and he started understanding about usage of crude oil only on seepages wherever naturally it was coming out it was getting refined so when the demand means the value of kerosene started uh, this involves known to mankind especially in united states there was more demand for kerosene because whales were very expensive kerosene was quite cheaper so that is how the refinery started and there was a uh, demand for oil where to search it seeps were not sufficient so they started uh, digging ev everywhere and edwin drake he was the first guy who thought that we have to drill use a new technology try to drill uh, drill, um, drill deeper to produce oil so that is how the demand slowly started in the mid 19th century and he was the first guy who did it in 1859 in us that was the, it, it it is an area which is known as oil creek in pennsylvania so within 7 years the first indian well also was drilled by macclough stewart company that was in jaipur in upper assam so in 1866 so from 1859 the first well in us 
which was an oil well but the first well in india in aprasam was not an oil well it had complications and they had to abandon them and the first oil well was uh, successfully drilled in 1889 by assam uh, railroad and uh, trading company art and that was that everybody now knows that it is as digboy well number 1 okay it is a very very famous uh, well which was which was drilled very close to a, a, a seep which was detected and the britishers it seems they said that dig boy dig so if you dig deeper probably you are going to find oil so that's the, that's how the name of the boy uh, came out so so in the history of uh, oil exploration the next step which took place was in 1870 around 20 uh, after 10 or 11 years after the first well uh, was drilled by drake that standard oil company was incorporated this is a great grandfather of exxon mobil company which is there in us okay so initially started a standard oil and this was incorporated by john d rockefeller rockefeller is a very very well known he, he just like uh, your uh, microsoft founder so so in those days okay so he is known uh, world over for his uh, philanthropic work he has invested lot of uh, money in um, uh, Um, all all sorts of um, uh, social uh, work but when he started his business he was so cunning and he was so uh, you can say that um, he had um, within just months of um, establishing uh, standard oil he had wiped uh, wiped out all the competitors by some way or the other and he had a monopoly and that monopoly continued till 1911 when the court uh, ultimately had to declare that he has to stop this and uh, the company was broken so he is one guy in oil industry everybody is uh, like uh, knows how he started so now coming to the exploration styles so we already started uh, the thing we were discussing about seeps as the f- the first um, uh, like uh, we can say uh, evidence okay of occurrence of um, uh, uh, crude oil so everybody was trying to look okay wherever there were ships start uh, drilling so if you look at the first picture on your right hand side you see lot of it is just a cartoon so you you find that there is a kick okay and there are a lot of um, uh, rigs okay aligned in a straight line so along the creek people are so that was called as a um, oh, sorry uh, along the ships so that was called as a seepology and similarly the ships were confined to the creek okay so people thought that only those ships which are there in the creek are successful for uh, drilling a well so that was called as a creekology so uh, most of the rigs were all uh, the in pennsylvania they were all aligned and they were drilling only in uh, a creek so um, it, it was called as a creekology so have a creek uh, go and try to drill a well there in fact why there it was uh, this thing successful was because there was an anti cline the sedimentary beds made an anti cline there which had an accumulation of oil and on top of it the erosion there was a river flowing okay so there was a creek a valley which was created but because not knowing the subsurface what exactly is happening in the old times so there was no way of knowing what is there in the subsurface they probably thought that drilling in a valley would will, will result in a successful um, drilling of a well and finding oil so then comes the uh, in uh, 1861 the, um, the, a great guy by name um, a great geologist okay hunt so he started finding that the oil is occurring okay it is by anticline he he came out with an anticline theory that if you find an anticline okay you are going to find oil okay so that is where all more oil is mostly found in anticline so and he may yeah. i interpret, interrupt uh, yeah. uh, there is there is that uh, you know stop sharing hide uh, thing is there now can you please hide that thing We, uh, okay yeah so uh okay so but that that vanishes everything now okay so let oh, me oh oh okay or you so, can drag it to some place and put it i suppose yeah i'm sorry because it was blocking more of the now understand is that okay okay okay, okay. Yeah. so let's okay so now it's gone fine yeah please it's clear okay so the anti cline in theory so we're talking about that so the, the hunt and followed by andrews okay so they came out with this wonderful theory that if you want to find oil look for anti clines and that is how the geologists started getting a lot of attention and they were paid to go into the field and map anti clines and people whether there are seeps or there are no seeps okay so they were trying to drill anti cline so you, in the surface you find some anti cline probably it is going to extend into the subsurface and that's where you are going to find had to cover so even today so and it was it was commonly called as bumps okay 
find the bumps. That's what used to be the, uh, the thing, order or the exploration manager tell the geologists. Go and find out the bumps. So if you find bumps, you'll find hydrocarbons. Even today, today's seismology, uh, the uh, seismic, everybody tries to first when you want to do a structural mapping. So if there is a closure, if there is a bump in the seismic, okay, people are happy. So whenever somebody is trying to look at a seismic, he's trying to look at the bump. That is practice even today. So that much of impact and that much of this te technique of finding oil in a structural closure, anticline or four-way closure, or it's a salt pierced dome. If you look on the right hand side, you have salt at the bottom of, in the cartoon, okay? And there is an, uh, an application fold or sitting on top of it. So these type of folds are in, induced by a salt piercement, and that's why they are called as a salt piercement structures. So it, is, it, it can be a four way closure, means it can be a circular, uh, the same, uh, you can say inverted vessel sort of a thing. So then coming to the early geophysical tool, the first geophysical tool which uh, really was used for oil industry was um, uh, by a Hungarian, okay, it was, you, you may be, I think in physics probably if you have uh, under studied about it was, it was correction or something like that. So he used an, uh, uh, an instrument which was called as a torsion balance, okay, to understand about the change in the Earth's gravitational uh, pull okay in different places on the earth so so the, that torsion balance was used to understand what is there in the subsurface so if you look at the map that, that map of a toss so when you had done it so there are arrows which are showing in different directions okay so those arrows are showing about the gravitational pull direction so if you look at the circular the red um, dotted circle so all around that particular circle the, the pull is away from that, that particular place, okay? So he said that there is a low density material because the gravitational pull is uh, influenced by the density inside the earth. So if the density is lower, the pull is not, is away from that, towards the high density stuff. So, uh, and they had made some contours and it appeared that there is a low density material. And so there has to be oil, there was seepage, so they drilled. So the, the methodology again, you, you have some seep, you have this uh, low density is another uh, way of looking at oil. So that particular technique, when it was successful at Eggbell, okay, in present day Slovakia, immediately even in US, the torsion balance was started using in 1922. And by 1930, torsion balance, which was slightly modified later on, and it was it, it became a gravimeter, what we know presently as a gravimeter. So it was used. And within eight years, they had mapped most of the salt domes in US. Gulf Coast, okay, and there were drills, and they were successful. Find a low density salt dome, and that's what we saw on the previous slide, okay. So, the salt cold anticlines. So, most of the salt cold anticlines in the US Gulf Coast within eight to ten years, they were all mapped. And there was another technique which was used, uh, which helped them was uh, the seismic refraction profiling, okay. So, that was just giving the top of that particular salt dome. So, the um, um, Fairly, so you have two uh, technologies. One is a torsion balance, which later become gravimeter and the seismic refraction. And the real, real change which happened during that time in 1920s was by Kashner, okay, Kasher in 1921. He demonstrated that the seismic reflection survey can give the layers of within the earth. Okay, it's not a single layer, but multiple layers. And if the first uh, the reflection profile which he had generated you can see it on the right hand side there okay so shall i use uh, the cursor is visible when i rotate yeah. that cursor yeah, it's, it's visible yes sir yes, it's visible okay so if you can see that he could uh, see that it is a surface there where he had put his geophones and he could map an inclined surface below that and he said that this layer can be detected that was a shale layer okay and uh, below the shale uh, the the limestone uh, this which was giving a reflection so he could um, uh, demonstrate that and that is how the technology started advancing in the 20th century okay so the oil importance started in the late 19th century earlier it was only kerosene and you you believe it or not in the early 19th century still the um, uh, internal combustion engine i think it uh, around 1885 which was developed kerosene was used for lighting and all other uh, heating purposes and the petrol, today's petrol, what we say here, gasoline, 
in the west okay that was all dumped into sea or in rivers okay it had no value at all only kerosene had the value otherwise it was the asphalt leaving these two things any other product which was generated from crude oil had no value so it was just dumped thrown away and today we know that kerosene uh, apart from kerosene there are hundreds of use for every fraction in the distillation okay of the crude oil so that is how the the world has changed within 100 years so the, the next technology which came to in, in the uh, in the early 20th century was a rotary drilling so uh, till then it was only a percussion drilling they were trying to uh, go, um, uh, go deeper which was not achievable so the rotary was not was able to take them to deeper depths so in in, in 1920 that was introduced and also they started using flooding for improved recovery so if you want to recover somewhere you have to inject water okay so that the pressure gets uh, underground the pressure is maintained and you are able to produce more oil so that was understood by in, in um, uh, 19 uh, in 1920s and the next step which goes into the oil well is in 1927 somebody says it is about 1924 i'm not sure which between 1924 and 27 okay the schlumberger brothers in france okay the these two brothers they lowered a resistivity measuring tool inside a well and recorded the resistivity okay you can see that old um, the, the vehicle the truck of schlumberger brothers there is a winch and a guy standing on top of it the two brothers taking the measurements and what you get the values you were getting from the well there as it goes deeper the recorded values of values against the depth were plotted and this is the first plot which they generated in france then subsequently by 1930 when we had a lot of drilling taking place on land people thought that the prospective area the lucrative area the oil extends into offshore or swampy areas or into bay area they should also be able to go there and drill it so that's how in 1930 offshore drilling started though this was not exactly offshore drilling it was a very 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 shallow water okay near shore and transitional zone drilling only by 1950 people really started technology improved and we started going into offshore and start drilling in open sea in the ronda then comes the digital um, uh, technology transformation computers started so those computers were the big computers so the digital signal recording okay it changed the the landscape of uh, oil industry till then most of the surveys most of the work was everything was analog okay analog meters is just like your speedometer in car or nowadays even cars have digital meters <coughs> so the technology changed by introduction of digital computer and then comes the seismic data processing so lot of machine number uh, punching was required to process the seismic data which was being acquired everywhere around the world so The, the digital computer started helping it by 70 the direction drilling came so that instead of just drilling vertical well you can drill an inclined well you can make a semi inclined well you can have an l shaped well you can have an s shaped well means the top vertical then make an incl inclination again make it vertical so all sort of um, inclined um, the directional wells people started drilling so even in india by 1975 so we started drilling the first directional well the okay, attempt was done in mumbai high so i witnessed the first directional drilling in kg basin in 1986 after it was introduced in india in 10 year the 10 years back in 75 the first well was drilled in uh, uh, that uh, rawa today is uh, today the field which is known as by name rawa okay on east coast so those days it was known as uh, the structure 16 gs 16 or something like that so the 16 6 and 16 7 so i witnessed uh, those two wells as a directional well by 80s the 3d seismic data was started uh, the same uh, it became very popular the technology came okay lot of technology electronics had uh, the same made into the transistors uh, had given way so you had all um, electronics the modern ele modern electronics into the market so the 3d seismic data started it became in, in fact uh, quite popular hmm? so everybody you started seeing that until then it was a linear seismic data which was acquired, which was being acquired so i will show you some of those things how those that, that technology changes so this is just an introduction about the timelines what is happening and followed with, uh, after that i think 1980 onwards even in my earlier lecture i said that 1980 is a transition from um, the, the the old technology into the modern modern day technology and um, science okay 
the after 80s 3d came then you have got work stations computing power increased so personal computers came there were mainframe computers came there were uh, servers big servers available and then the virtual reality stuff like that so even the 4d size we started coming in after 3d and then now we have artificial intelligence and machine learning which is uh, it's a white hot topic even in oil industry uh, so we'll talk about all those things so now we start introducing one by one is the first we'll look at the magnetic survey so initially the magnetic survey was only used for understanding the changing in the magnetic uh, susceptibility of the rocks okay in oil industry you, you know that the magnetic total magnetic intensity if you measure on the land okay so it keeps changing as uh, underground the magnetic uh, the means the rocks change because every rock has a different magnetic susceptibility and the sedimentary rocks have a very poor magnetic susceptibility even compared to the igneous and metamorphic metam 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 rocks so the higher total magnetic intensity starts indicating that you have proximity to some of the basement or in um, igneous or metamorphic metam terrain on that so whenever they had an indication of um, uh, higher magnetic intensity they used to contour it and high means it was a it was a basement high so anything which is draped over a basement high there was a possibility of finding hydrocarbons and they were successful in finding hydrocarbons that's the reason they started using magnetic survey in oil industry okay and that was slowly replaced by aeromagnetic survey subsequently during the world war time okay so nobody allowed to use aeromagnetic aeromagnetic was a very patented defense uh, equipment which was used for detecting the submarines so people are not allowed even today if you want to do a seismic survey there are a couple of instruments you are not supposed to take it on, on, on your ship while acquiring seismic data okay so because the defense doesn't allow the um, use of such techniques to detect which can detect submarine or defense activities under the water so only after the uh, this flux gate magnetometer was used in world war 2 and one after the world war, world war that was allowed for commercial and scientific uh, purposes and in 1948 laman doherty today it is a, it is called as laman doherty um, uh, institute um, the observatory they used this okay on board of the ship and uh, <clears throat> and towed it across atlantic and they could make a magnetic survey of the ocean bed soon scripps institute of oceanography followed that in 1952 they conducted the first marine 2d magnetic survey and they could see the magnetic stripes what we know today as uh, the uh, like uh, uh, sea floor spreading uh, magnetic anomalies so they were the one who had observed it for the first time that there are some repeated strips available of magnetic polarities on either side of a ridge and um, Uh, uh, and they were not uh, sure how su such repeated um, uh, strips of um, uh, normal and reverse polarity happen so so this magnetic data in fact it opened the oil industry as well as it opened the plate tectonic theory <coughs> and we had um, we discussed a little bit about the gravity and little bit of magnetic we are not going to detail um, this is just um, um, a <coughs> louisiana map of um, uh, on the left hand side you have a gravity map on the right hand side you have a magnetic intensity map okay you see that the red colors here uh, on the gravity map are the gravity highs the orientation running around north east south west trend and on the magnetic intensity map you see that it is the total magnetic intensity the highs are depicted by a lighter shade of blue or almost it is whitish and the deeper shade of blue or um, sky blue are the, the low okay so you have a high and low the trends are not matching so the magnetic susceptibility the trend is totally different than the gravity high trends but yes so this is how the people at the basin scale or a large scale they try to use it and to understand what's happening in the underground at the basement level what fundamentally we need to really understand about the magnetic and gravity okay this is good for the freshers as well as the students in the university is gravity measurement both of them they are a passive measurement okay there is no signal sent to the earth and received or something like that we are just measuring what's happening what the earth is giving back okay so a pull which is exerted by the earth at different places gravity measures the, 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 the gravity instrument measure and um, the magnetic um, instrument measures the magnetic field the variation in the magnetic field because of the magnetic susceptibility okay this the gravity field is a scalar okay it only is influenced by dominantly vertical uh, uh, 
signal okay so whatever is happening gravity pull is only vertical okay up and down so it is only a resp uh, responding to the vertical uh, the, the field whereas the magnetization is a vector quantity okay it is a very very direction and this is quite complex than gravity and it can have any sort of orientation it can have a dip it can have an azimuth direction and it can have multiple poles also because in the past the same north and south pole were not there okay there is a flip and flop there is a wandering of polar the poles are also wandering even today's north pole is shifting slowly from greenland towards russia so um, that complexity which is captured in the sediments as well as in the um, igneous rocks okay that creates a bit of um, complexity of uh, magnetization so that is slightly different when compared to gravity so you have to just understand about that as you go deep into understanding about the magnetic uh, survey intensity and um, uh, reduce to pole maps and stuff like that so uh, you start understanding how those things affect the the left hand side uh, gravity map okay this is one form of a gravity map which is called as a booger gravity the booger gravity what it does is uh, it is just removing because we know that the topography of the earth is not uniform okay it is not at the same level it is not at the same sea level so you have to remove the effect of any elevated topography okay sitting adjacent to you so if you are on in a valley okay there is a pull of the adjacent hill or uh, the, so you have to remove that particular influence of that mass trying to pull the gravity upwards when the earth is trying to pull the, the it's uh, pull the instrument uh, towards its center so that that difference if any is subtracted you generate a booger gravity map okay so it is in very simple form i, I try to explain about that and these type of techniques okay technology is used for detecting the deep discontinuities in the basement basement faults and trends okay so it helps in understanding a basin at the basin scale what is happening in a, okay for um, uh, in, for oil and gas business then we come to seismic reflection okay so this is a very very uh, uh, important aspect seismic reflection data even today is a very very fundamental i think it's a driver for our industry a lot of money is being spent in exploration to acquire seismic data to interpret process it and interpret it so that um, uh, it tells about um, where oil and gas can be found before we drill a well so if you look at exploration this um, uh, seismology and especially reflection seismology this particular technique can image up to 150 kilometers deep okay so but it's really of no use uh, the thing uh, what is there below 50 kilometers to 150 kilometers because the image will be very 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 shabby okay it is very very difficult to interpret it also whatever is processed and what is seen in the seismic but to say that it can image up to 150 kilometers okay and the useful information you get it up to 10 kilometers of depth you get most of this at this depth it's, it has a the good resolution when compared to gravity and magnetic or any other geophysical tool okay and that is the reason because it has a spatially good resolution as for detecting even the smaller events below the earth that is being extensively used to find oil and gas then okay. so what you see it on the right hand side i'm now just trying to zoom it and show you okay so here look if you look at the vertical section it is about 30 kilometers of section okay the sedimentary basin is hardly around six or seven kilometers somewhere there below that it's all you have an arcane terrain there it's igneous uh, stuff it's a crystal um, uh, rock but you find a lot of reflection stuff like that this is my own work which i did just two years back okay so that was a basin in the um, outside of india so we're trying to work out how the basin has evolved okay and uh, what is there in the rift sequence of that particular basin so what you find is uh, you, you can find the word mantle written here okay we for sure know that this is a mantle we wanted to understand where is the crust mantle boundary so that is a mohorovicic discontinuity okay so can we really see the, the that particular uh, boundary there okay so seismic there are plenty of reflections so we need to use somebody can just interpret it and say that okay it looks like okay i'll take a pen and then try to draw that mm. oh. 
Oh, the pen is not working. I don't know. The pen. Okay. So somebody would say, so that's your mantle. Uh, that is your more of a discontinuity. Okay. But you need to have a proof. You need to have other technologies. So what I had done then was it's another um, technique of um, understanding. Uh, it is called as a water-filled basin subsidence one D airy isostatic model. Okay, if you have heard about airy and Pratt's isostatic theory, okay, so how the basin subsides and uh, how the balance of the crustal balance can happen in in areas and iso um, in the Pratt's model. So that model one D model I generated at number of places and I tried to see what can be the thickness of the crust. Okay, when you import that particular thing. It was trying to show me that this is the crustal thickness. This is the crustal thickness. The red one is all crustal thickness, and the crustal thickness changes over the. Uh, so, the base of that, if it is matching somewhere very close to those reflectors, probably yes, this is the reflector which shows you the, the crust and mantle boundary. So there are a number of things. So even the igneous intrusions which is taking place into the basin, you can model. If you see the light, the, the sand, uh, uh, sandy portion is shown by yellow color representing a basin filled with the coarser plastic and a tiny um, red color which introduces so it has a mixture of igneous as well as um, uh, plastics into the sediments only you use those by values you are able to balance that particular entire section and you reach up to the reflectors what you are looking at the base so this was one of the ma model which i had generated it went into geological society of london in their some of the publication so i did not use this particular uh, a slide it was another slide which, which which went from bp okay so for um, a symposium which they had they were holding two years back so how seismic data is used in the oil industry quickly we can say that the seismic can be used for structural analysis that is for mapping the structure okay as we map the um, uh, on land uh, the thing or on uh, present day earth any uh, online surface mountains, hills, and stuff like that, or any geological mapping. So same way, in the subsurface, you can carry out mapping. You have to pick up one particular horizon and keep tracking it. So how it is behaving in on, in, in three directions. Um, so so mostly, I think 50 or 60% of the seismic is used only for structure analysis. Then you can do some phases analysis. Like in geology, the phases are changing the rock types laterally. Okay, A sand becomes a shale shale becomes a limestone or any, any sedimentary that's so a phases distribution on the surface of the earth in, in the depositional environment is change in the lithology how it happens whether it happens abruptly or gradually similarly in the seismic when you see that seismic reflectors are changing seismic reflection packages are changing it's called a seismic phases and such study such phases changes are studied which is called as a seismic phases analysis and similarly a sequence like you find in the outcrop exposure a, a, a rock sequence similarly in the seismic you can have a seismic sequence which needs to be studied so there is an uh, there is a study a special study it's called a seismic sequence analysis and a seismic attribute analysis like you study uh, outcrops for some attributes like sands if you study whether it has got current ripples or so on, or it is um, parallel uh, this thing layered okay it is a um, um, normally graded uh, sandstone or it has got uh, different types sorts of uh, sorting and stuff like that. It is a coarser or it is angular or rounded, all sort of things. So they are the attributes in the outcrop. Similarly, there are attributes within the seismic data in the subsurface also. So that attribute analysis is specially studied to understand what's happening, what we can infer about that particular package in the seismic. And similarly, what we see geomorphology on land, we can see we can do the same work okay, in the seismic. But we cannot say directly, we cannot link that, that geomorphology. So that is why against every analysis, a seismic word is used because it is seismic phases, seismic geomorphology. That doesn't mean that the geomorphology is exactly in, it is what you see today. Okay, So there have, you need to have a correlation established okay, with more data, more drilling of wells, more rocks to say that what you see in the seismic is exactly what we see in uh, the same rocks. These are some of the examples which are from my own work. Okay, in one of the this is I think Albert Basin in um, uh, Africa, a Lacustrian Basin, uh, the thing where I had used okay the techniques to find out the seismic phases distribution and seismic geomorphology. You can this is a deep water example, deep water basin. You can see canyon, you can see the fans emerging um, uh, from um, 
east direction and north south canyon cutting so even on the seabed you can see the canyon uh, uh, feature okay on the seabed so all this type of things so seismic can generate all these type of things so when we keep on telling about this thing fundamentally everybody will should know on the, what exactly is that what are we talking about when we are talking in seismic so let us understand it i think it will definitely help the postgraduate students about if you are going to learn geophysics as a part of your course and if seismic is one of that so i think this is going to open you or introduce you to some of the basic concepts what is a reflection so a reflection is nothing but if you on the surface if you fire a gun okay if you explode make an explosion okay that sends a uh, an event okay it's a compressional wave sound wave acoustic wave it goes inside the earth and whenever it finds a boundary between uh, this, with the change in uh, some property there it reflects and it comes back up to the surface and if we have a, in, an instrument to record the vibration which is called as a receivers okay the receiver can record some vibrations up and down up and down okay so this is called as a reflection so there there are hundreds of layers inside the earth and every layer can reflect the a sound wave go, go acoustic wave goes down it get it hits it reflects and it comes back to the receiver it is recorded so you this is a two layer model if, you, if as a very simple case you are looking and what the why the reflection is taking place there is a property which is called as an acoustic impedance i have written here simply as impedance but it is acoustic impedance okay against the layers like between these two layers <coughs> the difference every layer has an acoustic impedance what is that acoustic impedance it is the product of velocity of that particular layer by which an acoustic wave or a sound wave travels oh, and the density of that layer the velocity of the layer and the density of that particular layer the bulk density defines a, 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 a value which is called as known as impedance okay so every layer will have different densities why it is simple the surface layer will have less density because it has less compaction it is very recently set in the deposited as it as the deposition takes place the deeper and deeper the sediment layer going it is getting more and more contacted it is becoming more and more dense that's when it becomes denser its velocity structure changes even in your house if you are trying to knock on a wall to see if the wall is hollow or if it is a solid how do you know you change in sound if a hollow sound comes you know that there is nothing behind that that is why you are getting a hollow sound if it is rock solid <coughs> you don't get a that hollow uh, reflection back so that is exactly the way uh, the sound works in in, uh, in earth layers so smaller the change in the impedance okay change in the impedance is between these two is the smaller is the reflection <coughs> you have an acoustic impedance i1 and i2 the difference between them is very very less you get a very small reflection a very weak signal received if the difference is more you get a bigger signal okay so this i used to use as a part of an exercise whenever i, I teach about um, some seismic fundamental for um, the geologists so we discussed about let us say shale is one rock okay it has a velocity of 2000 density of 1.7 grams per cc this is a bulk density and below that is a layer of sand which has a velocity sands always have a higher velocity 2400 meters per second and a density of 1.8 okay now you know that the product of velocity and density is the acoustic impedance of one sand has one acoustic impedance which is higher than the shale the reflection coefficient how the reflection is generated is derived by an equation of the impedance of the lower layer minus the impedance of the upper layer divided by the addition of the impedance of both the layers okay if you look at, if you use these particular values of velocity and density for the lower layer okay and the velocity and density acoustic impedance of the upper layer and the same one is added bottom you find you come out with an answer that reflection coefficient for this particular <coughs> layer okay reflecting surface is around 0.119 let us say it is 0.12 Okay, what does it mean? It means if you have a density and velocity contrast like this, if you f send a sound wave downwards, it only 12% of that particular energy, sound energy, uh, is reflected and all other energy is transmitted. It goes deeper. Okay, this is a fundamental. You have to understand about this. It's very, very simple. Give a thought. You can capture it as a screenshot. Try to run this exercise and feel yourself that, yes, you get those answers.
again the second exercise here what we have done is the upper shell remains same whereas we replace the lower layer by carbonate it has a higher density of 2.1 and the velocity in carbonate also is higher so it has an impedance value different you work out the reflection coefficient the reflection coefficient okay has, has become now 0.23 means 23% of the energy is reflected back and remaining is transmitted just by changing so now what we are saying it you know now that you know how to calculate the impedance okay so for the one layer so let us we have four layers here you have a one impedance value so that's a vertical line we have density rho 1 and velocity 1 and then you have a second impedance value by density rho 2 velocity rho 2 so that impedance value is higher okay so that is the reason this particular plot is showing an increase so the impedance low is on the left side high is on the right side so the third layer has a slightly more impedance when compared to the second layer so it is further it moves to the right and the fourth layer has got a lesser impedance so you see that the values have shifted to the left hand side so you now you have a profile of you have measured means you you have some information from the earth sir earth down earth okay about the densities and velocity of different layers so you could make an impedance curve of that okay and then you know the value of um, uh, <coughs> reflection coefficients you, can, you you know the formula so you can measure the reflection coefficient so we know that if you have a higher uh, impedance value sitting layer sitting above the lower impedance you have a reflection positive reflection okay you get that value of 0.3 or 0.12 or something like that so the next one because you have a very slow the slight change between the two impedances you have a smaller bar of a positive impedance a reflection coefficient the third layer and fourth layer contrast what what is happening is has a negative impedance means the fourth layer has a lower impedance than the third layer so it will have a negative value of the reflection coefficient on from the equation and same on the fourth and fifth layer you have got a positive so now you know that you can now calculate the reflection coefficient also so what we try to do is use a pulse now what is this pulse a shot on the surface of the earth it can be a dynamite okay or it can be a vibrosis so but this dynamite will have a calibration so it has to have a maximum amplitude a very short duration so a calibrated shot of a wave, known wave form is shot there so they all travel down and they come back when you do that what happens so this is what the seismic trace you are generating this particular pulse is interacting with your reflection coefficient positive reflection coefficient it generates a positive reflection so the peak here is black and the trough is red okay similarly the second one layer also had a positive reflection coefficient it generated another peak the third layer had a negative reflection coefficient so it generated a trough a fourth layer had a very very strong so the wave which was trying to try to come back into trough they it found out that suddenly there is a very very strong reflection so instead before it could go into a trough it again picked up and made another big uh, peak and a big trough so this is how the seismic works and you get a trace okay a reflection so the instrument on the surface is tracking this and it generates a wave form like that because of the properties in the subsurface i think is it clear is simple or it is it is become complex now we'll say some hello hello as yes, to students no, uh, is it simple and understandable yes 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 please go ahead i think students are uh, just listening <laughs> they're right. not responding okay no problem Uh, students if you have uh, participants if you have any queries or any doubts you can put in the chat box or you can unmute okay. yourself and uh, ask so can you quickly i will take you through that now we know that seismic helps in understanding about the lithology okay the contrast between the lithology if there is a change in uh, lithology we will be able to generate a seismic reflection okay and that can be tracked in the seismic um, uh, data So what happens if there is hydrocarbon what happens to the same seismic response okay so here is an example because even in the oil industry even after putting lot of service okay or the work many geologists 
fail to understand the how seismic works the fundamentals of that they are all doing very good interpretation work they are all generating excellent maps everything but when you when you have to analyze the seismic okay the fundamentals are very very important okay if you fail to understand those the small concepts okay you are missing something in the seismic to interpret okay and that can lead to a disaster of not finding hydrocarbons so now we are coming when we can understand about the lithology contrast how what happens if there is some fluid like oil or gas or water into those layers what happens so we we knew that acoustic impedance okay the same one you have a sand shale and uh, um, shale sand and shale so it had an the shale had an acoustic impedance sand had a lesser acoustic impedance and then shale has again a normal acoustic higher acoustic impedance so the wave what will happen it will make a trough in a shallow section sands are always more porous they hold a lot of water okay and shales are slightly compacted and they have higher densities than the sands when it when as soon as the deposition takes place you can measure it in any estuary you can measure it in any river bed but the thing shales are high, um, denser that is the reason you have an acoustic impedance higher than the sand at very very shallow deposition of setting or burial depth when a deeper burial takes place slightly the sand becomes more compacted cementation can take place pores are reduced stuff like that so the density increases the velocity increases so you have an acoustic impedance is increasing so the sand gives a peak okay so positive uh, <coughs> reflection coefficient it peaks now when it goes further deeper and deeper the sand becomes really hard and compact okay so it is the porosity is further reduced so it gives more acoustic impedance because higher velocity higher density so you have got a very strong peak black peak now we are to, let us try to fill in some hydrocarbon we have filled some hydrocarbon in the lower section here okay where i'm my mouse is rotating the upper one up just above that you know this is a very shallow section so we knew that the sand had a low impedance okay it has a lot of porosity if you fill gas or oil which have low, low lesser density than water the density the total the bulk density is going to further reduce for the sand so that's why a earlier trough trough of the uh, the waveform which was red it is going to become a very strong trough it gets further pulled up okay this is the effect you have to see it in size then what happens we have intermediate buried um, sand it had a very normal peak the sand if you you start filling it with hydrocarbon the peak became a trough because the density velocity contrast the acoustic impedance reduced it was positive earlier it became negative reflection coefficient became negative okay so it was positive on this side if you can see that okay acoustic impedance was higher now acoustic impedance reduced because of the filling of the sand with the hydrocarbon reflection coefficient became negative that's why you got a trough negative peak further deep maybe 3 kilometers or 4 kilometers what's happening the sand is already was very very high uh, density velocity so it was a positive it is a more acoustic impedance positive reflection coefficient even if you by filling hydrocarbon the positiveness has just reduced it has not become negative the reflection coefficient just came back towards um, you can say zero so there is the strong peak which was which is seen here okay when in a water filled um, uh, sand in a hydrocarbon filled sand that peak became less so now these three categories are called as a direct hydrocarbon indicators okay so this is a very very modern the last 20 years or 25 years the oil industry is working only on dhis that is direct hydrocarbon indicators the first incidence where you where it became the shallow shallow sand became very strongly negative amplitude or it a trough is called as a bright spot okay and the intermediate buried sand which showed a, a strong positive um, amplitude became a negative amplitude is called as a phase reversal okay it was a positive phase the black became a red like a trough a peak became a trough so it is a phase reversal for that particular sand and for the third sand a very strong black peak became a, a milder black peak so that was called as dimming dimming of the sand so these three things if we can locate in the seismic you are very close or you are sitting on top of the hydrocarbon so the seismic can say that it is showing you a direct hydrocarbon indicators is an example real example from the seismic data so again so here it is black and red is now it is blue and red so because the the, the color spectrum is used here is um, blue to red 
uh, through uh, white. So I'm just trying to, what you are seeing on the right hand side, we have already discussed about the same thing. Okay, in a seismic trace, number of traces we are using. It is like a seismic section. So a bright spot will have this black you see, it has become a more black. Now you are asked, you will ask now, in the earlier section it was red, why you are, um, which became a trough, which became a, a stronger trough. Now you are trying to show me, it is a, a black colored uh, st stuff which is becoming stronger. This is nothing but, unfortunately, I am not supposed to show this, but it is called as a polarity reversal section. Okay, How you want to represent your data is in your hand. Somebody wants to represent a peak by black, it is fine, it is his way. Somebody wants to represent peak by red, it is his way. Okay, In this particular, in the previous section, peak was represented by black. Here, peak is represented by red. Okay, That is the reason the trough is black. The blacker trough was dimmer here, it became brighter. So it's a bright spot. Now, now what's happening? So the peak, which is red, has become a trough. This is a polarity reversal. Can you see the anticline here? So the red, if you try to trace, it became blue. And again, it becomes red. And what is this flat um, uh, line is nothing but it is a contact, hydrocarbon contact. Okay, so oil water contact, which is oil shale contact, oil, oil gas contact or stuff like that. The third dim spot is similarly like that. A strong amplitude red color became a lighter red. So these principles, when you try to use it in the seismic, the answer comes like you can see this particular section is interpreted here as hydrocarbon. Okay, a dimming section, a dimming interval with a with a very very flat horizontal line which can be a hydrocarbon fluid contact oil water or gas um, oil contact or gas water contact so that's how the seismic is interpreted for direct hydrocarbon indicators okay, i think we have taken too much of your interpretation of the technology but yes these are the fundamental things how it seismic is acquired on land is like we have a source as we discussed we have receivers laid as the seismic signal is passed the acoustic signal is triggered it reflects against different layers and the receiver receives them. If you look at the raw seismic data in the field, it looks like this, a cone and an anticlinal reflection, uh, reflecting surfaces, okay? This cone is nothing but, you have, you have receivers from the source, okay? The source is in the center. This particular picture is only showing the one side of the um, source, this way. Whereas this particular record is showing on either side. So you have again reflections taking place on this particular cartoon. So on both sides, each record is trying to start measuring the uh, disturbances or reflections after some time, travel time. Okay? The farthest uh, receiver is there. It is going to get the same uh, reflection from the same surface after a lot of time from the first receiver. First receiver gets the signal very early because the travel time is less. So that's the reason the last sig signal which is received from this particular surface at 2150 offset meters, it, that particular receiver starts fluctuating only after 1.5 or 1.6 seconds, okay, than the first. So that's the reason you are getting a cone there. So there is an exercise which I'm leaving it, it is not meant for the beginners here. But just I wanted to show that this is how the seismic data is recorded. You have the geophone. These are called, the receivers are called as geophones, okay? The land geophone is, um, um, the picture of um, a real land geophone is shown there, which is uh, grounded to the earth. There is a nail below that, so to um, pierce into the earth and get a good contact, so that the instrument inside gets all the vibrations. So this particular, um, the, the middle um, image is about a 3D seismic data acquisition. Okay, it's a, a 2D seismic data acquisition is like you are hitting it, this, the above some picture is about a 2D seismic data. So in one line you are shooting and one line you are recording, the geophones are laid. If you are shooting in one line and you are recording in two directions, so that's called as a three-dimensional acquisition. Okay, so you, you can see that three-dimensional, you, you have the cables laid in number of lines, lot of lines. Okay, and it can receive, and you have got these trucks which can generate a seismic signal, which is recorded by this closely spaced uh, lines, which gives you a, a 3D um, uh, so, sort of a um, illumination in the of the, from of the subsurface. 
So the truck, which is um, the, the real truck uh, the photo is shown here, is called as a vibro size truck. Okay, the instrument here is lifted up hydraulically, and suddenly it is dropped down. It makes a thudding noise, thud. Okay, the earth shakes. It, um, it triggers a signal which goes into the earth and gets reflected. So that's how the seismic data is acquired. <coughs> Offshore, it is slightly different. You have a ship. And you have got um, cables laid behind the ship. Okay, these cables are behind the ship are called as uh, steamers. Okay, so this is an eight steamer um, vessel. So you have you find eight lines, and the, the, the receivers are the red dots. They are red. There are thousands of receivers on every cable. So the cable length can be um, five anywhere between five to ten kilometers long. Okay, and um, the you have the, the, the source of uh, seismic is called as a um, uh, this is an um, air gun so you have an array of air guns red guns so the compressed air suddenly is released so that it makes a wave on the on the surface just below the surface of the um, uh, sea and it, it sends the, uh, the wave which hits the seabed and also uh, the sink travels into the earth and comes back okay so that's why that's the reason on the land we were calling the receivers as high geophones here it is called as a hydrophones. Okay, the, all the red dots are hydrophones. So if you want to acquire 2D seismic data in offshore, you have got a, a ship and you have got only one cable behind that. So that's that can acquire in a linear fashion. If you want to acquire 3D, you have got the number of streamers. So it's the eight steamer uh, the same. You, uh, you can. So what the ship does, it keeps on moving to where uh, right side, and um, the, uh, the um, uh, air gun. Will be making boom, 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 boom sound every 15 to 20 seconds. Okay, it it loads and very and every uh, this periodic time, fixed time, as a 15 between 50, as a 15 or 20 seconds, it makes a boom. Okay, so they are all synchronized. We generate um, a, a wave and the and the signals are received by this thing. Whereas in, in a given speed, this uh, vessel will be moving, and it it moves again. It makes a rotation, comes back in this direction. So the next eight lines will be recorded in the lower part here okay so it it, it will be making a zigzag line for acquiring 3d data in an area so that's how it works this, this technique has been since 80s in, uh, in, in both so earlier there were lesser steamers now we have more and more steamers longer steamer lens so the steamer lens you can say that it's up to 10 kilometers in this particular cartoon so there is a new technology which started emerging by the end of the century which is called as a multi azimuth sim uh, data acquisition okay in what what we do usually in uh, normal conventional uh, narrow azimuth it is only in one direction the ship is rotating moving okay and that data is acquired here the same area is acquired by different direction movement and different direction data already so that's why it's called as a multi azimuth this helps in imaging okay the subsurface in a much better way and the resolution special resolution as well as illumination is much much higher okay in a complex areas where you have got a lot of salt tectonics or um, igneous and stuff like that multi azimuth can really help to resolve those issues Another technology which which started at the end of uh, the century is called as a VATS, wide azimuth technology in seismic data. In wide azimuth, what is that? We have seen on the first slide of seismic data equation offshore, it had eight steamers behind a ship it acquires, whereas the sound source, or the, the um, uh, hydro, uh, sorry, the air gun source, you have two air gun source, one at the beginning of the, um, the uh, close to the steamer and uh, one at the end of that. So in a flip flop way, these sources will be working and the seismic data is acquired. The ship moves with its towed uh, steamers to the next uh, area further away, another eight steamers away. And again, triggering these two air guns, data is acquired and it moves further away. It moves further away. So at least four passes it tries to do. Means a wider azimuth coverage. Azimuth is as far as you can acquire your data from the source. So it is going to go, go much deeper and much broader area in the subsurface going to cover. The illumination will be better, and many complex lithologies, especially like basalt, like salt or even basalt, okay, can have the top and bottoms can be 
resolved in the subsurface. That is the reason this is becoming more and more popular these days. I think even in India, they have started acquiring it. I, I do not have much data about that. But first time this technology was used in 2004 in um, the Gulf of Mexico in Mad Dog, which is again a BP operated um, field. Okay. So th there it was used. I think in Kutch offshore, I do not remember, or in West Coast, they have used this uh, thing, wide um, um technology to acquire data in India. And the last one to say about is the 4D. Okay, what is 4D? 3D we have understood that in two dimensions, X and Y, we are trying to acquire. So it, and the depth, it gives a 3D image. The 4D is time. So you have a 3D data which is acquired sometime. And you come back to the same area, okay, and you have a, a field you have discovered, you acquired the 3D data, you have studied it, okay, you, you drilled a well, you made a discovery. After some time, you want to know really how much oil really we have flowed and how much is still left. Are we able to sweep and completely take out the oil or uh, we are doing some mistake and there is more oil to discover? That, is, that was the reason this 4D technology was invented. Okay. It is coming back to the same area and recording the 3D survey again after some few years. Okay, Keeping the geophones or hydrophones or whatever it is you want to say at the same location which was kept earlier, which is a challenge, big challenge, but it is possible to do that. How it is possible? The easiest way to do it is online is very easy. You have GPS nowadays, wherever you had put your receivers, you can go back and keep the receiver the same place. Place and acquire it. In an offshore, if you have used hydrophones, okay, it is a bit challenge going back and getting it. That can be some few meters of uh, shift here and there. That's the reason ocean bottom cables came into existence. OBC. OBC means you are going to keep the receivers on the seabed itself. You lay the cable, put the uh, receivers on the seabed. So now when you are trying to keep the, the receivers on the seabed, you can use the geophones now because you are going to couple it to the earth directly, not floating on the uh, water. So the geophones on the ocean uh, bottom were kept and data was acquired. So if you have a plan, there is a discovery that if you have a plan to acquire in future uh, <coughs> 4D, people started doing their surveys on using ocean bottom cables. Okay, here is an example from India. That is again when I was in Kane, so I had a um, chance to look at this particular data. So it is Rava field, as I was telling about that, the first directional drilling in Rava, I had as a young geologist in 86, I had uh, witnessed that. Subsequently, we started producing and it was sold to Kane Energy. The Kane is the operator for Rava even today. In two, year 2000, they had acquired <coughs> 3D OBC, ocean bottom cable. Okay, This is the seismic data. In the year 2010, when I was there, in, uh, 4D was acquired, okay, so um, the, which was called as a monitoring 3D. So it is a baseline 3D, is it in the year 2000, and uh, 4D, which was acquired in 2010, well, is shown in the lower part. What changes we are seeing? It? What advantage we got it? Let us simply look at You see this red reflector. You are able to, I think, when the cursor is moving, you are able to see this red particular reflector. This was in year 2000. All this inclined well and the blue lines are they're all wells, okay? Wells with a gamma ray log sitting on top of it. So they, they show the well path. The field produced, and in 2010, when we acquire a seismic data, this red red color has vanished from this particular part here on the left hand side. Correct the block. You can see a fault running here, the F2 written. So the left hand side block of F2 the red color has vanished. What does it indicate? This is hydrocarbon which was existing there, oil, okay? So in 10 years, the oil has been completely withdrawn, means it is produced to the surface. It is, so the, it is, the sweep is very, very good in this part. Porosity is good, permeability is good, they are able to produce it. But if you look in the middle block between F1 and F2, the red, dark red is still existing as a dark red. So the production could not be achieved. So the, the sweep efficiency in this particular block was very, very poor. Okay, there are, uh, there are wells in that, though they are not on this particular line itself shown, away from off, off of uh, this particular line, in either in the behind or in the front, you will have a well to produce from this particular well. But the, there was no, not, not a much of uh, sweep has taken place. So we know that there is a leftover oil. We need to have something, drill a well here or wherever you find a pocket 
which is left behind. So this is the way the technology is going to help if you have a 4D. Okay, and an advancement in the 4D was instead of laying a cable, okay, you can directly in lay the instrument, leave the instrument on the seabed, which is called as a node. Okay, so it is called the ocean bottom nodes, OBN technology. This was used in 2009 in uh, Atlantis field, again in Gulf of Mexico. Okay, they have left them for acquiring it whenever they want. They can go back, acquire seismic data, and record and, and, and get the information out of those uh, nodes, and then process it and um, generate a seismic volume. So this is how the seismic uh, technology is helping in um, oil industry acquisition. So basically, when we discuss all these things, we are using seismic in what way? We are using either to map the structure, we are using to map stratigraphic and lithology and fluid interpretation. Okay, so we have seen all these things from um, for the past couple of slides. But there is a caution. One has to understand that just because we are we are able to see this is not a silver bullet. Seismic um, uh, data equation. If you have seismic, you can do everything, and discovery is guaranteed. No. Uh, forming seismic interpretation is not a fail-proof solution. Okay, the oil industry is a highly regulated business, and data alone cannot guarantee results. So just because somebody says you got this data and you have a success, it doesn't really happen. Why it doesn't happen? Let us see now. This is the reason I used this particular slide for just um, a couple of weeks back. Another presentation to the industry itself. Okay, so what's happening here is. This particular graph shows about the commercial success rate of DHI supported wells. Means the wells which were drilled because they found some direct hydrocarbon indicators in the seismic. Okay, what is this showing about uh, this? And versus the wells which were drilled without DHI, also all the wells of the world. Okay, whether you have DHI or don't DHI, total well exploration success versus the commercial success rates in DHI supported wells. For the last between 2008 and 2019, normal success rate is shown in the black dotted lines, whereas the DHI wells, okay, DHI supported wells are shown in the red line. You see that most of the time till 2015, okay, the DHI well supported wells had more failure rates. They were not uh, success rate, the commercial success is not very good. Okay, without that, also people were able to discover oil. Only since 2015, okay, the DHI has making a concern. Why it is so? That's the reason. If you just find, you need to have a lot of analysis. It's just because seismic is showing something, unless you have not properly understood, okay, what is the reason behind this particular DHI and the seismic. Just drilling a well because you find a DHI, it's a disaster. So there is more to seismic to understand, analyze, and drill. Okay, so. That's the reason I wanted to give you a caution that, okay, so don't be very happy that you understood about seismic, you understood DHIs, you have ABO, you have DHIs, stuff like that. So 2008 to 2014, the success rates seen. Non-DHI, 23%. DHI, 29%. Oh, sorry, non-commercial versus commercial. DHI, non-commercial, commercial is 29 when you see the DHI wells commercial uh, the same benchmarks is now it has improved and it is more commercial it is uh, becoming. So it is another one. This is for purely stratigraphic traps. So I think in the last session when we had um, the trap types we had discussed about you have structural traps, you have stratigraphic traps, that is how combination traps, the strat is structural. Okay, structural are like dome, anticlinal, subsurface anticlines, um, a dome or stuff like that. A stratigraphic trap is just sudden change in the lithology from a porous permeable rock into non-porous permeable rock. So stratigraphically, the oil is trapped inside because some um, um, impervious layer is not allowing to migrate. So that's how the sands, a channel sand or a, a sand lobe or a pan, it, it gets hydrocarbon charged and it stays there. So people have drilled wells, changing the stratigraphic traps. And this is the record of success of using a DHI versus non-using DHI for a commercial discovery. OK, so let's not get into too much of uh, those things. Just for a caution, I, I thought I should uh, include these two slides. And the seismic survey grids, just as an information for uh, youngsters. So you have these all these gray lines. 
what you see running, they are all 2D seismic lines at acquisition in offshore area. And the closer spaced lines are again 2D at a very um, close spacing. The, the spacing between the um, uh, these lines where the cursor is moving is around approximately 20 kilometers. So every 20 kilometers, you have one seismic line. And in the uh, other direction, this is called the dip direction. You can say either a dip direction or a basin direction, in line. And again, the cross line direction, you have what a 10 kilometer spacing or something like that. This is very sparse 2D seismic data, regional or government data or some company data for reconnaissance survey. Okay, that's why it, that's what it's called. Then subsequently, when companies buy some acreage, okay, when they're skeptical about investing a lot, they go for a very close grid 2D seismic data. That is the reason you find that very close line spacing. Some uh, some areas you have got very further uh, line spacing is closer. This was an old style of acquiring data where they were people were hesitant to go for uh, 3d seismic data because it was expensive over the change of the century and in the last couple of years there is not a much difference between the 2d and the 3d seismic data acquisition pattern or the cost if you can tailor make and if you, you design your own uh, data acquisition plan properly i think just little bit slightly more slightly uh, higher than the 2d seismic data you can get a very good 3d seismic data that is the reason you find the yellow blocks here are the acreages okay held by different companies for their exploration works these are all the leases or exploration license or something like that okay they have, they have obtained from the government and the filled lines like green blue and gray are the 3d seismic data which has been acquired you can see that some companies have acquired complete block their acreages with 3d seismic data and there are certain companies who have acquired outside their acreage holding also this is called as a combined large 3d acquisition along with adjacent blocks license holders partners adjacent to the same so that helps in reducing the cost so that is the way nowadays the companies are acquiring is have partnership have collaborations get a bigger survey and in the same and exchange the data with adjacent neighbor with the neighbors so that helps in understanding the subsurface geology trends how they are trending how it goes into the next block and um, what can we learn from the next block now another technology i'm just trying to introduce here is a cscm marine um, survey okay this is nothing but measuring the resistivity of the beds okay using the same ship like seismic data acquisition you are using it you have a towed um, a streamer there and a, 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 a emi source a electromagnetic source just above the seabed okay that is towed by the 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 ship which is uh, floating there and as it is moving it starts sending a signal to the earth and there are instruments which are laid on the seabed okay they receive the signal so instead of seismic data acoustic data we are we are using the electromagnetic field reflected from the earth okay and this is just an example of how it looks like electromagnetic um, um, the, 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 the resistivity profile the values of resistivity the, the theory behind it is hydrocarbons are resistive okay water is non resistive so if you have hydrocarbons in the subsurface the value of resistivity there is an anomaly of um, uh, resistivity so we start showing as a high resistive uh, uh, peaks okay that's how you can detect it is a simple way of looking at it there it can develop into a very complex situation based on uh, changes in the lithology stuff like that but for the basic understanding yes there is a survey which can okay, uh, support the seismic data acquisition and independently verify whatever seismic data I say. So that's called a CSCM. Okay. They, this is an example of a CSM survey. So instead of just going through the, um, the text, what is written here, let's focus on the images. So you have on top, you have a seismic data, which shows very, very bright amplitudes. So we know in the seismic already, we have, we have become experts now of understanding so bright amplitudes means there is some DHI, okay, direct hydrocarbon indications. So seismic interpretations showed that the structure is so big, the anticline is so big, and everywhere you have, you have hydrocarbons there. Okay, they drilled wells. Now, there were failures. The first well was a success. The second well, which was you know, drilled there, was a failure. So they wanted to understand what happened. The first well, which is also in the lower section, is shown here, which is upper one. It had a seismic amplitudes, okay. It had an AVO class three response, DHI, 
okay the direct arrow pan indi indicator avo stands for amplitude versus offset okay the offset uh, as a um, um, receiver offset increases or the trace offset increases the how the amplitude is behaving so let's not worry about uh, this uh, um, uh, very technical term there but it is a dhi it had a dhi what happened when they drilled a well the gas saturation was 80% yes gas disks were very good it had a high resistivity values even the lower section is showing the um, <coughs> resistivity values from conducted from cscm okay um, survey so the resistivity values were quite high it is shown there okay excellent there is a good match what happened to the next well which was drilled seismic amplitudes they are still seen so the well path is there it is still seen avo was there direct hydrocarbon indicators yes it was there gas saturation in the well is 7% so there was no gas it was only water resistivity from the cscm it doesn't show any resistivity very very poor resistivity so people try to claim that yes you, if you would have run this particular cscm survey you would have avoided drilling a well there and you are you are full of hydrocarbon your field is confined only to this particular uh, uh, um, area okay so you can have an alternative or a supporting technology whatever you are trying to do on seismic use that technology and try to see that are you risking your money in drilling a dry hole okay and then get surprises so this is just an example a technology and as an example okay so there are a lot of there is a big gap in understanding about uh, this for a beginner yes it's, it is fair enough coming back to age old technology of remote sensing it is an immense help to use in a remote sensing in a hydrocarbon exploration offshore no use because um, it, it can only generate a, a, a sea surface servicing on land and all the, uh, the on land area adjacent to the offshore acreage you can have remote sensing the tools map it understand the structural trends okay understand the lithologies understand the lineaments and stuff like that one of these is a side looking airborne radar with the image on the right hand side so you can interpret a lot many things on that and th that is how a regional study in this in uh, oil exploration is done using these things okay even today the big companies use this remote sensing and there are guys specialists sitting only to interpret remote sensing data for our workflow next comes is another technology using again a satellite uh, based uh, techniques this is called the synthetic aperture radar sar radars even india has uh, the, i think isro has this uh, particular capability in 2002 2003 i had visited okay so i was still then in ngc we were doing deep water we wanted to use the sar technology for our deep water uh, offshore area but somehow because working with a government agency the speed at which we want information and analysis it doesn't really match so we had to go to um, npa is a british company which uh, had those uh, screenshots for uh, indian subcontinent so we took help of uh, some of the npa data for understanding what happens what is this technology all about so let us forget about the image on the left hand side for for, uh, for the time being or maybe it is not in, it is more um, uh, to explain different techniques there we will focus on the right hand side so this is a screen capture of um, a sar um, <coughs> image from the satellite what it does is it sends a microwave which is reflected from the sea surface and it has a back scatter so and it is received from satellite again water reflects very strongly because of a capillary wave action so it is a good reflector so if you have oil on top of water there this oil may be because of oil slick from the tankers oil seepages stuff like that okay or it can be from the subsurface which has come up to the surface and it's floating there on the screen on the uh, on this um, uh, <coughs> sar on the screen you see that it has a black patch because oil does not reflect okay so the water can um, uh, water is reflecting there oil doesn't reflect let us see really what happens when you are in a c band okay so the normalized radar cross section okay your nrcs when you are using that in the c band you see that uh, the, the intensity in decibel decibel is there you have a slick oil fill sitting there suddenly it has dropped and again it comes back and that is what is captured here in the screen as these black patches these are all oil slicks okay this directly doesn't say that there is a seepage from the the, the uh, underground there from a known field uh, structure and 
even oil tankers wash their tanks you can have a oil slick there is a leakage from the tanker so we need to really understand rule out all the possibility that this is not man made okay and then we can fix it that it is coming from the down so this gives an indication if you are in a frontier or offshore area you have no seism you have just seismic data no well drilled don't have information about hydrocarbon is present or absent stuff like that these are the in the information these are the technologies give that yes there is a source rock working in the basin it has generated hydrocarbons it is accumulated and somewhere there are some leaks through which it is coming to the surface so if it is leaking means it is existing there we have to go down drill wells analyze the data drill well and uh, start producing so to know about a, a very very virgin basin sar really works a wonder okay but we have to eliminate that what you are looking at it is not a uh, uh, spillage and there is another technology which is called as a hyperspectral image analysis okay this is very um, of late this is becoming very very popular this can work both on land and offshore okay this can it is airborne so you can use an aircraft run this particular uh, survey and it can it, it can have it is very effective survey tool and it can record around 200 wavelengths okay of reflected and emitted energy so you can even analyze about whether it is what type of oil is being spilled or it is what is the composition different composition exact composition will not be able to different composition of oils so is it a crude oil is a process oil is it a diesel spillage okay the stuff like that so there is a lot of scope for um, getting this particular thing it is just picking up for use in the oil industry for um, understanding about even in online if there are seeps to detect it and uh, try to understand about it. now the, the the further we go is about the pock marks it's again an indirect um, indication about the uh, presence of hydrocarbons if you have used a seabed bathymetry seabed map using a multi beam echo sounder usually we do it when we acquire 3d seismic data you have you have a bathymetry map generated you ask the, the, the company acquiring to use a multi beam echo sounder so it, this is a map generated at the uh, it, it is at the barents sea okay the so seabed map you see the circular patch of holes there these are all nothing but pock marks when the gas escapes it leaves a crater behind it okay so those crater like features on the seabed are indicative that gas is coming from the <coughs> the seabed means down below there is definitely a hydrocarbon generation process taking place and uh, we have potential to go there and drill and the seismic data when you acquire it it is also supported by some haziness and stuff like that so so it, it this technology also is work so now let's come to industry and how we uh, use it uh, all these technologies and in our exploration work flow so this is the how, now whatever we are going to speak is how we in industry work okay as a geologist or a geophysicist or a geoscientist oil industry for a beginner can be split into two components upstream and downstream job of upstream is exploration and production job of downstream is refining and then marketing those products in upstream the different segment there are three main segments of upstream exploration the job is to find hydrocarbons okay finding oil and gas which region which uh, which basin where where in the world we have to go in which basin and which block and even in in a block we will license to take where exactly on the license once you do that it goes to a development so if you discover then the field goes to development and they say that how much reserves how many wells are required to um, uh, produce from that what facilities are required and is it profitable so this is development even there are geologists sitting in development and doing the work so that's called as the development geology and when it goes to production once you develop this field production job is to produce the hydrocarbons manage the field properly okay so you should not allow the wells becoming sick and uh, stop the uh, production and uh, deliver this particular crude oil or gas or whatever is to the customer maybe it is refinery or there if you have gas it directly to a customer okay industries who are using gas for their work so the enp company basically it is a very demanding company okay so what it wants it always it has to be healthy and running any company for that matter why only enp oil and gas company any company it has to be healthy and running so in enp they always want that whenever they are producing oil, uh, hydrocarbons they want that there has to be more hydrocarbons discovered and so that in the reserves available in the pocket because with production 
the value in the subsurface is slowly decreasing. You are producing, so you are depleting your reservoirs. So you have to discard somewhere and keep it ready so that your production continues. You are able to sell your hydrocarbons. So that is the first criteria that whatever you are going to, that is called a reserve replacement. You have to find new commercial volumes, at least at the rate which you are producing. So this is the job of exploration and exploration geoscientists. So, and exploration finds, discoveries have to at least either are equal or more than the volumes you are producing. The next demand what it, the exploration company always asks is, keep your exploration costs low, okay? Add new barrels, but the cost has to be lesser. So what is exploration cost? Whatever you have discovered, if you divide it, whatever your money you have spent. So that, that defines your exploration cost. And most of the companies want to see that it is below $1 per barrel, okay? So that is like, a, it's a benchmark. It, it really doesn't happen, but some places it, it happens, but that is the wish they always give, okay? If you look at the company, company uh, this in perspective, as a youngster, it's very important. Like you need to have a business sense. It is just not like science. Science doesn't take you anywhere in, in a company. If you are, you are working in a private oil and gas company or any private, even mineral company, okay? Your science takes you at certain levels. Your science with a business sense, okay? Makes you a great leader, may, makes you a great scientist, okay? So that is the fundamental driver. So when you are doing your MSc course, understand that whatever you are learning, whatever you're trying to apply, does it make a business sense? It doesn't make any business sense. Your science is only research, okay? It is of no use to, uh, a company are making money. Companies, they want always make profit, make money. What makes them uh, profit? Your reserve growth and reserve production. On the right hand side, if you look at that particular account too. So the operations, the company is operating, so by production and by mm, uh, exploration, you are adding reserves. So that makes profit. So the shareholder stake increases, the, the shareholder's capital grows, okay, and he also gets a return on his capital. So he'll be happy. The next um, the thing with company, it, it is under control of the company is the finance, okay? You are very, very particular, meticulous. Your cash flow is, you, you can show the cash flow growth with the reserves and your production growth. And you are also uh, very <coughs> meticulous. Your NAV growth also, net asset value. Okay, the value creation, it grows. So the company really makes that. The company should not depend on the market value. That is equity market. Your shareholder, your share market today, your share may be trading at, a, let us say in India, it is about a thousand rupees or two thousand rupees. Your business is not really doing good. The share market value really not, doesn't drive your company's system. Company doesn't really want that. Okay, because this is very fluctuating market. Today, everything is rising. Your company share value may rise. Everything, the share market drops, your company value drops. It gets eroded in, in, in a matter of few hours. You should, that is not in the com control of the company. Okay? It is out of the control. If it happens, it is happening good for the company, okay, it's good, but do not depend. So that is where your science and your business sense have to see that what is in the control of the company, you have to deliver. The other one is the commodity prices. Oil prices, you know that Maybe a few years back, it was, it was more than $100, okay? And today it is around, it is around between 40 and 50. It, oil price can drop, oil price can increase, okay? So don't depend on making profit or company's growth just because international market uh, tide, uh, it is doing well, so we are doing good. If it drops, we are doing bad just because there is no value. That, that should not be the uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, motto of a scientist who is working in industry. So the questions a geoscientist in the company has to answer, as already we have discussed, is where in the world we have to go, which basin, which, in which part of the basin, okay? Where we have to drill, what type of hydrocarbons we'll find it, what is the volume we'll get it, okay? What sort of rates we'll, uh, we'll be able to flow back, and what is the risk? In a nutshell, if you, the risk, the, ch the challenges the company, uh, a ge geologist has to answer is, is how much oil and gas we have got. If you say some, so you say that okay, go and drill here. So the manager will ask you, the company, uh, the CEO will ask is, how much you'll get it? Okay, what is the volume you're speaking about? So the fundamental equation of resource calculation for in oil industry. Okay, this is the deterministic equation. Okay, at this level of uh, understanding, it is it is more than enough. Okay, even most of the geologists in oil and gas, they are using only this. Okay, so be happy that you know what they are doing. 
hydrocarbons in place, if you want to calculate, you should know the gross rock volume. The gross rock volume comes from a structure map, mapping the structure, okay, and the net to gross. Either you need to know the gross rock volume into net to gross, or you need to know the area and the effective thickness of hydrocarbons. So you multiply it, you get a volume. Okay, so but the best way of uh, this thing, understanding it is know the gross volume, know the net to gross, porosity of that particular field. What is the hydrocarbon saturation in that field? If you divide it by the formation volume factor, you get the hydrocarbons in place. Okay, what is there? So this volume is what this is the surface volume. Okay, that's all. It's also called as stock tank oil in place. STOP, stock tank oil. We don't want to measure anything under subsurface because somebody says in subsurface is this much, but if it is not there, I we everybody wants to see that how many barrels on the surface you are going to fill. That's why oil, all oil reserves, all gas is only measured in terms of volumes on the surface. What happens is when it is underground, the oil it has got dissolved gases, so it has a volume. When you produce it to a surface, that gas escapes because of the pressure drop okay and the oil volume shrinks that's why we call that as a shrinkage factor have you seen the cube which was there in the subsurface became a gas cube shown by red and an oil cube shown by green the oil cube dimension volume is less than which was there in the surface because a part of it became gas and is escaped when you can mix the gas the volume becomes same so the oil has shrunk and it will not fill a barrel on the surface if you say that it was a barrel in the subsurface. That particular shrinkage factor is this formation volume factor, which you are going to divide so to find out the reserves. Recoverable reserves is a recovery factor. If you have, if you have found out um, in place reserves, in place um, hydrocarbons, you multiply by a recovery factor. How much you can recover? You know that in the subsurface, you have 100% cannot be recovered. Even in mineral exploration, mines, Whatever your uh, reserves you are calculating, 100% reserves cannot be exploited. So there has to be a recovery factor. So recovery factors depends on many things. We'll try to see the time permit. So we'll look at those things. Okay. So this is the fundamental equation which gets you the volume. Okay. The same equation, but what we are trying to see is in the equation the gross rock volume. Where from you are going to get? You will get it from the seismic data. The net to gross porosity and saturation you will get from the wireline logs. We'll talk about those things, okay? So this is why the seismic data is important is because the fundamental aspect of any resource estimation has to come from the seismic data. There are other techniques and workflows to find seismic net pay. So the net to gross is not known because you have got a very few wells. Still you want to estimate and you, you be very close to the accurate value. You can use some techniques. But again, it's, everything is not foolproof. You need to have a constraint on those things. Calibration, perfect calibration with the drilled well information and stuff like that to use the seismic net pay um, methodology to come out. <clears throat> so there, your net to gross from the well can be replaced by seismic net to gross. This is like, you can say that it's all fine. It looks very, very exciting to be in oil industry, but companies cannot drill a dry hole. Okay, so if you say that you have to drill a well and produce, if the well becomes dry, many people lose their job. It is as forward as only in the government companies like ONGC probably a, a guy cannot lose his job. He continues to serve till the age of 60 and he'll retire in a small private company. You just, you have a project. Okay. You come out with a, a wonderful uh, structure and you say that it has um, all, all sort of things and they drill, you make them spend. There are possibilities, and it goes dry. There are possibilities you'll be kicked out. Okay, it, hap it, it, it happens even in a mineral industry, in a private industry. So we have to be very cautious, cautious as a geologist. Companies cannot afford to drill a dry hole. Okay, that is the reason. Where to place that well? What should be the path of the well? What should be the depth of that well? Okay, and what what is a prediction? before we start drilling the well. It's very, very important. That's the reason the companies hire geologists, geophysicists, all specialists for imaging, interpret stuff like that. Because of hiring and paying salaries, in spite of it, you're trying to do some <clears throat> rubbish. The companies, I think, <laughs> justified in kicking us out. So now look at the cost of the barrel. So why it is, uh, it, it is such a big gamble. The oil industry itself is a big gamble. Let us go back 20 years in 1999. Okay, you look at 
the cost of the in the market the value of uh, a barrel of oil was 24 okay dollar 24 per barrel of oil so if you look at the breakdown of it from the company side company was spending around 2.6 dollars for exploring around 6 dollars for developing for operating means producing pipelines <coughs> stuff like that maintain the maintenance around 3 dollars it was giving tax to government around 2.4 dollars the basic cost for producing a dollar a barrel for a company was working out around 14 dollars okay just <clears throat> that is your cost of um, uh, oil and in the market it was getting 24 so you had a margin of 10 dollars when the oil prices fell to 12 dollars company started tightening exploration budgets exploration spend so maximum they could do it is okay exploration can be managed in 1.7 dollars development around 5.1 operations in two taxes again the tax is reduced because uh, straight away government says to pay with the price has fallen you pay tax based on the market value then. <clears throat> so it is 1.2 the basic cost from 14 dollars it came to 10 dollars okay but what we are getting your costs are 10 from the market you are getting 12 dollars so you made only two the margin is only two dollars per barrel there was a decline of 500 percent <clears throat> in the margin but just because market declined 50 percent from 24 to 12 but your profits got eroded so that is the risk the company uh, this runs okay so that's where exploration the cost of exploration why they are saying reduce the cost of exploration reduce the cost of development why company keeps on telling is because of that because it's a very very volatile market in the world today when you look at the today's picture okay today it is around 48 49 so this was in November when I had made this uh, slide for, for some of the purpose. This was that was around forty dollars per barrel was uh, market price, international price. Cost of the bar cost per barrel, okay, the wellhead cost, cost of the basic cost. What we are trying to look at here. If you look at different oils, okay, the Saudi Arabian oil it just costs less than ten dollars per barrel to produce. Even if they get forty, they are into good profit. Worldwide. On an average, it takes around 30 to 40 dollars per barrel. That's the basic cost. If you take, if you get only 40, you are making a <clears throat> very, very small profit or no profit at all. Look at the ONGC data. ONGC has a lot of, lot, lot many fields. So there is a range of uh, this cost <clears throat> per barrel from 35 to 40. Okay, some fields may be producing with a profit of five dollars. Some may not be just at no, no uh, profit. It's at cost production taking place. And when you see gas, uh, the production uh, the cost is around 3.8 to 6.6. Whereas Vedanta, which is K, which was Cairn earlier where I worked, which was taken over by an Indian uh, this businessman, um, <coughs> and it was the, uh, named as Vedanta, its cost per barrel is around 20. So if they get 40, they are still making around 20. So that's how it works. So this is a picture of global finding and lifting costs. Let's not look and uh, look into that how it is working. It is a uh, uh, let's leave this also about uh, break-even prices for finding oil. Okay, so it just wants to show that there is enough oil to find to produce at a cheaper rate between ten dollars to forty dollars. Okay, around eight hundred or nine or eight hundred and fifty million barrels available we produced. Okay, and today in, in the market we require about hundred uh, million uh, barrels. That can be taken care of. By this particular thing so cheap oil is still available even if it demand increases and goes up to 150 million barrels means your price is going to stick to around 50 dollars per barrel around for a longer time that's what i wanted to show it that was for a different uh, uh, perspective in the company we'll skip all those things and come to a simple exploration process so what we try to do in an oil industry geologist identify opportunities capture some prime areas acquire data seismic and other data process that data make an interpretation of that geoscientific interpretation come out with some prospects to drill get an approval get budget to drill drill a well if it is a successful well drill an appraisal or a confirmation well if it is a failure you have to drop the prospect go to some other acreage or some other prospect and drill or abandon that particular project acreage and walk away if you are successful in a com confirmation well also, you, you know that, okay, so whatever we calculated is working our way, you can go develop it and 
put it on production. So this is a simple process, exploration process, and how the oil companies work. Now we'll quickly try to run in an example uh, uh, run. Okay. So let's say that today we are this all these webinar guys. We are a company, and we want to do exploration. So the, the, the government of India has put on a lot of exploration blocks for uh, 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 companies to buy and uh, do their activity. So this is a real example of the Indian uh, the thing. At some year, uh, a few years back, the uh, the government of India really had put these blocks on uh, uh, for uh, under open acreage licensing policy. So let's say that we we bid them and then we bought two blocks. Okay, we did a lot of work. We looked at all the seismic data. These all these lines are all seismic data, and we analyzed. Okay, all satellite gravity, magnetic stuff like that. We came out with um, our own interpretation on east coast, west coast, and where not. So we did, we used our um, magnetic gravity, magnetic information. So let's say because this is all real data I'm trying to show you. So this is a gravity information. This all to point post to see the uh, where is your uh, valuable block situated. And another uh, this is a magnetic data. And we say we bid for two high prospective blocks in Mumbai offshore. Okay, in the license and the government awarded us. When we got the blocks, okay, these are our blocks. Okay, as a company, the team all mapped and they came out with six leads. So there are some structural leads, stratigraphic leads, combination leads. Six. The team, exploration team, approached the management and said that this is a wonderful block. We have done all this um, due diligence and um, risk analysis stuff like that. Company ran com their economic and risk analysis criteria, and they said that okay, we agree for two blocks to be drilled, two wells to be drilled. Okay, identify your two uh, best structures and come to us. So now what we do? We take our best bet, and it was lead A. We name it as Tiger, Tiger, because this is a brand new company. They don't want to fail, so we are trying to say that it's a Tiger prospect will drill. Decided to drill a well on this particular prospect. What is the definition of this prospect? This is an anticline cut by a fault in the northern part. Okay, and we interpreted that it has oil as well as a gas cap. Red is gas, green is oil. So we drilled. We have done all due diligence. Hazard studies were done. Everything was taken care, and it was decided to turn. Okay, that was a cartoon. But in real life situation, this is a BP map. Okay, where I work. So in real life, your seismic map looks like this. So you have got Atlantis, which we talked about earlier. Mad Dog um, field we talked about earlier. So these were the fields which were mapped like this. Okay, and in a 3D view, 3D seismic data, the Atlantis structure looks like something like that. The upper part is a seabed map. Now let's come back to our own example, our company, like webinar company here. So we are drilling our prospect tiger. We made a well schematic. The geologist of our team has given the well prognosis. What we are going to penetrate in the well when we drill it. Okay, this is a prognosis. This is an estimation. Okay, and with the ages, the thicknesses, and the drilling team of the company has designed a well to put the casings and how many casings are required what is um, expected uh, the same like sizes and stuff like that so this is how a, in a real company well prognosis well schematic and drilling plan look like and we need to have how much to know about what is the time required to drill a well so the, the, the drilling team gives you a two best estimates about a probability of drilling it in less than uh, in 10% uh, chances of drilling in less than this blue line this okay and there is a 50% chances that we can drill that well by this green line. Okay, so we have to see that we are always on the left hand side of the green line. Okay, means number of days taken to drill a well has to be very, very optimum. We cannot. Why we cannot uh, the same keep on uh, drilling, crossing these limits? Because every day is going to cost you more money. Okay, and we know now what is the tagline is exploration costs have to be less than a dollar so, okay the company always wants that so that's the re reason so what else the geologist has to do geologist has to predict the subsurface pressures so this is a pressure prognosis you have got a subsurface pressure curve generated with a hydrocarbon column pressures exerted so fracture gradients and total overburden gradient so this is the job of a team in the geology to generate this particular pore pressure analysis and hand it over to the drilling department so that they can design their casing and design their how to drill a well. Geologist also has to have a subsurface temperature profile. Okay, so he has to predict 
so what does a geologist do he he also gives because nobody is for sure okay things change sub surface is 100% is not anybody is uh, the same it, we can only even a drilled well will not give you exact the well information which is provided is only at a location just a kilometer away from that well location things change so that's the reason we need to capture about the temperature in a ranges like the minimum temperature expected the maximum temperature and the most likely scenario of a well when we drill the temperature what can it this are this is the required for the drilling equipments the logging equipments for the cement for the chemicals which are being used because the temperature is going to play a devastating role on the properties of those things so that's why a temperature prediction and a profile by a geologist is fundamental then once we do it that we will go for hunting for the rigs we our plan is ready well plan is ready in all aspect so it is just an example of showing that on land rigs how they look like there are some uh, uh, truck mounted rigs there are stand alone rigs in offshore there are different types of rigs so you have what in the shallow water in the bay area stuff like that and you can use drilling barges in shallow waters less than 150 meters or less than 100 meters <coughs> you can use jackups okay jackups have got three legs and a cantilever uh, uh, rig which is sitting there which can move in inward and outward and the third type of um, uh, rig is called as a drill ship okay this can go in any water depth mostly deep water wells are all drilled using um, deep water uh, ship chiq is the one uh, this thing uh, drill ship which i personally had used it when we drilled in sri lanka so i know about this i visited this ship because we had had it this is a japanese ship okay this was early uh, earlier drilling ocean drilling program this is a this was a scientific ship scientific expedition ship used for ocean drilling projects okay first a commercial well it drill only for k they never knew how to drill a commercial well for all oil, oil company when i visited that we had seen lot of scientific laboratory huge laboratories lot of equipments which were not needed for us because we never had that expert with us to sit there and analyze we always wanted all the samples to be brought to land and get them analyzed so that is one other thing and the fourth one is a semi submergible it has four legs there it partly submerges under water that's why it's called as a semi submergible if you look at the drilling rates okay a semi submergible present day it cost anything about for every day per day okay more than 150000 dollars that's why that's the reason when we looked at the drilling timelines we need to do it the well very fast it is because the cost of building rigs per day it is for the, this is the current information okay it is, it is, i just pulled it from ihs market with database october 2020 if you look at the drill ships it is more than 200000 dollars per day one day you lose okay so you are spending that much of dollars and similarly for different rates like a jackup rates they do around 75000 dollars land rigs cost a little less this has an captured information about last year data we showed about dirubai field which is operated by reliance industry okay they like in 2019 they booked the drill ship <coughs> um, at at a cost of um, 260000 per day okay so that is th th these are all the real costs world over about the ships so these are the land rig ships now we'll come again back to our company and we are drilling a well okay so if you want to drill a well we should know about what exactly a drilling rig whether on land or offshore looks like usually a drilling rig has a crown block and a traveling block okay the traveling block is the one which travels up and down that's why it is like a crane if you look at a crane crane has a fixed crown there and it, a, a block which moves up and down to lift the load that's exactly the way the drilling rig works and this traveling block is connected to the drill pipes and the kali okay so that is the one which is rotating using the draw works here and drilling a well a mud system is pumped into the pipes to keep the system cool because a lot of heat is generated as you go deeper and deeper bit is under friction so it, gen it, it it's very hot so that has to the system has to be cooled entire subsurface has to be cooled that's the reason and the cuttings which are generated in the subsurface have to be lifted up okay so otherwise it gets choked the entire system can get choked so that's the reason a drilling fluid is used so this is a very basic um, uh, explanation about how the drilling works i don't want to go into this oil drilling uh, animation there we are running short of time let's say that our well tiger was drilled tiger 1 is drilled and now we are acquiring log 
logging can be of three types okay a wireline log in the wireline log what we do is you use a, a, a wireline acquisition uh, truck there is a winch behind the truck the wire line um, the wire is lowered with the tools attached logging tools attached it is sent into the well build well and while well coming up it can uh, record the uh, data physical parameters of different uh, the uh, um, formations and come up and that record is something like that okay it has uh, curves different curves the other one is like um, piped conveyed logging so if you have you are drilling a inclined well or a l shaped well horizontal well your wire line cannot send it because vertical well it's fine with the gravity the wire line can um, uh, slowly uh, you can lower your tools and pull out in an inclined well the tools will be on the lee side they will rest on the well bore okay and they can get stuck if you try to pull so that's where you are using the pipes the tools are all at the bottom you connect the pipes either uh, <coughs> drill pipes or the tubing some uh, production tubings and lower them into the well and then record it the recent trend for the last 20 25 years is being using drilling while um, logging while drilling so this technology what it does is it has coupled the logging sensors in the drilling string itself above the bit all the sensors are placed okay and the drilling assembly is made so while you are drilling you can keep recording the the signals and the electronic pulse are transmitted through the mud system so that's another uh, technology we are using so and and the, 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 it is received in the unit decoded and all the parameters are plotted the way it is plots are said so mud is used to send a pulse from the bottom of the hole from 4 km down the uh, surface okay to the surface and it is decoded from the mud pulse so these are this is just a sample of uh, the logging tools different types of tools and the logging unit here on the right hand side with a winch this is a wireline logging tool so this cable you can see which is used to lower the tools in the well application when you come to application of electrologs you are recording those logs basically why you use these logs and what information you get it we get in lot of information about the lithologies about the stratigraphy the density of the lithologies the velocity stuff porosity what type of fluid is there in different um, formations permeability to certain extent and you can even collect the downward rock sample using this wireline tool and you can even send an imaging tool below and you can image and of course pressure downhole pressure and temperature you can measure so the, the curves here which are shown on the left hand side is some of the examples of some line wire line tools so the green one is a gamma ray tool which has recorded okay so you see that a very steady gamma then suddenly the gamma has started dropping and it is picking up the the red one is a resistivity tool you see that a very standard non fluctuating resistivity within the shale section and suddenly when you encounter sand the resistivity has picked up it has become more and more so maybe if there is hydrocarbon there that's the reason the resistivity has increased and it drops the moment the change in lithology has taken place from sand to shale it has dropped and uh, there is a density and neutron curves okay so we'll discuss those things about uh, there are tools and there are types okay tools are like there are number of tools they are all been classified into different block types for lithology purpose what say uh, tools were using you are using a spontaneous potential so you you see that the tools are that the resistivity is spontaneous natural induced radioactivity acoustic stuff like that but the type is for a specific purpose when you are using couple of tools they are called as a type tools so for lithologic tools are spontaneous potential and gamma ray natural gamma ray so they give the lithology for porosity if you want to estimate you have got neutron density and so on these logs can give it porosity for fluid understanding saturation in fluid so you can use resistivity and induction and there are other log tools like sidewall core and modular dynamic tester for pressure and uh, sample uh, fluid sample micro imaging uh, logs are there okay formation microimagers caliper to understand about the borehole sizes temperature logs and magnetic resonance hmm? nuclear magnetic resonance this is exactly the same way as in a hospital you you run a nmr scan of brain or a body the nmr tool is used in the oil industry i think it is parallel it was it has evolved in um, uh, medical as well as in uh, oil industry for understanding about we try to use it for understanding the fluid content and other parameters the response of the logs okay so this is just a cartoon to show the log response 
gamma ray will be higher in the shales because shales have got a lot of potassium uh, they, they are aluminum silicates so you have got a lot of potassium right that's the reason natural radioactivity is low in gamma ray as it becomes silty and sandy the gamma ray drops cleaner sand it drops further and if you have some heavy minerals in the sand probably there is some increase in the gamma ray activity hydrocarbon sands they still have a lower gamma ray so it, it doesn't really affect whether you have got oil or the same gamma ray doesn't change it only that is the reason we call this as a lithology identification tool density also varies as per um, the lithology so if you look at certain combination of the logs you will be able to use them for understanding the hydrocarbon uh, if you look at the density and the neutron so the neutron the red again is oil, gas green is oil and blue is water in a sand okay yellow is all sand so the distribution of these hydrocarbon and water if you look at the neutron blue curve okay the gas shows a low neutron count okay so the neutron is captured by hydrocarbon that's why it is um, hydrogen in the hydrocarbons gas captures it more oil captures it less water captures it further less the density drops you look at the density thing if you have a gas filled sand it shows a low density we had discussed when we looked at seismic a oil filled sand has a slightly more density water filled sand has slightly more so if you cross plot these two things in the same track you find that there is a separation which is in the indication of hydrocarbons okay so that's how that is a technique which is used for interpreting the logs so logs do not give what exactly geologist is looking at what geologist wants is porosity saturation okay and a net to gross logs give you shaliness from the lithology log we have to identify the shaliness from the sand where if you have there are some thin shale layers and then move on to find out the porosity using the other two logs what we look at the density and neutron if you get the porosity value and we shale then we can come to a saturation um, log which is resistivity log knowing the porosity and knowing the water resistivity we can find out what is the saturation using this archie's equation okay and find out the water saturation if you know the water saturation 1 minus water saturation is hydrocarbon saturation and in reality this is exactly a petrophysical plot petrophysicist is a specialist um, um, a geologist who was specialized or geophysicist was specialized in understanding the wire line logs okay and about the rocks in the subsurface so this is the acquired data which is there in all black and white almost and the colored star is the interpretation of these logs giving a meaning about lithology that is sand is shown in yellow okay shale is in um, uh, brown oil is shown and and uh, and the fluids oil is shown in green and then comes your porosity which is shown here is in pinkish color and the saturation okay so this is the product of the equations what we saw in the previous section and this is the job of a petrophysicist to deliver these things and if he has done this calculation correct or not it can be always have the calibration is done if you on the wireline log you have taken side wall cores or you have a core in the well or in the laboratory you have measured a porosity on the core you plot it on the same log if your porosity is core porosity which are circles here if they are matching okay so then the porosity of your log is calibrated the same is for the permeability you are saying it and it it, it is equally equally it holds good for saturations this is just an example from dorado sri lanka okay on the seismic we are showing a hydrocarbon gas in uh, this in structure gas field at two levels so it doesn't really uh, now once you have uh, this thing run the logs you have you know that you have uh, there is some saturation you have some oil in that okay you have to test it and confirm that because only log is showing you have not physically seen it so you have to run a testing too okay in a well you have to run a test perforate the um, casing run the pipes and produce it to the surface okay so this is how uh, a testing is done you isolate that particular zone using a packer if they are inflatable balloons okay by a mechanical device by rotation these the packers get inflated they cut off the pressure in, in, of the mud in the in the column there in the casing and the formation is now the formation fluids are now free to flow into the tubing because suddenly their pressure is reduced 
on top of that. Otherwise, the pressure would have been acting on these particular uh, formation fluids and stopping them from entering into the well bore. So the production the testing makes the fluids come to the surface. You can know the flow rates at what flow rates we can produce. Then you can have a downhole data of uh, this uh, pressure downhole pressure data. You can collect the downhole samples. Okay, and this is the data which is going to tell you about the shrinkage factor which we use in our equation of calculation of the estimation of reserves. The pressure plots they look like this. Okay, and this is a specialist uh, buildup analysis. So this is called the transient analysis of the subsurface pressure and uh, temperature information which a recorder, digital recorder, which is at the bottom of the tool. When you pull out that tool, you can just um, download this particular data and analyze it. It is used to understand about um, the flow behavior and if there are any barriers or baffles for that flow. Once you are successfully flowed that well, so you are going to complete that well okay, with the tubing, put a Christmas tree and ready to flow it to the sand, sell it to the market. So that's how it was the Christmas tree is put. So this is the design of that particular well, showing different casings, cement behind the casings by some of the checkered boxes there and a tubing run inside. So these are the perforated interval, uh, oil interval from where the oil is going to flow into the tubing and is going to come following this red path, the surface. So now we know that our Tiger prospect is drilled. It is successfully found oil. We drilled another uh, well in the down dip there. Uh, that's called an appraisal well. We, we confirmed that that also is a oil well. Now the question comes is, what has happened to our picture? The picture did it change or it is the same picture by the more information we are getting it how many wells are required to completely drain this particular pool how much oil we can recover okay and what sort of facilities we are requiring and what is the time okay so the first oil we can see it on the surface how many time and what are the uncertainties so, so these type of questions uh, will remain for a geologist and the team okay to answer and uh, <coughs> we have uh, and we have already used this particular equation to calculate the reserve, resource and reserves. We are using the same thing to say that there are, okay, um, to calculate what this power tiger prospect is uh, holding. This is a live example about Atlantis, which we discussed about the BP uh, field in the Gulf of Mexico, okay. Our tiger prospect, we have not shown that it did not change much, okay. So it remained uh, the whatever the way we have mapped, but in reality, it doesn't happen. Look at this. Uh, Atlantis map in 1997. It was a very simple map like our type of the prospect. By 1998, within one year, okay, the map changed, the contours changed after drilling two wells there. And by 2000, number of wells were drilled, the fault started arising, coming into the picture. By 2005, the picture of Atlantis structure has completely changed, which was known to us in 1997. So this is the way more information you get start getting from the subsurface. The seismic gets calibrated, your loss gets calibrated, a lot of things happen, and the structure, it's information and understanding of the structure changes. And that is very, very important if you want to produce. Because if you think that you have got 100 billion barrels, and uh, uh, after drilling a couple of wells, it knows that it is only 10 million barrels, it's a disaster. So that is the reason when the when the shape of the, uh, on the, uh, the shape of your structure is changing, the uncertainty is reducing. This cartoon says that. At exploration stage, the reserves, what we estimated, uncertainty was so big. When you started drilling appraisal wells, uncertainty reduced. You started developing it, more development wells came in, the uncertainty started reducing. You started producing, the community production shows that what is the ultimate recovery. So there is a convergence of your prediction of reserves and actually what you produce at a later stage. But the cartoon is trying to depict that your uncertainty is the largest at the exploration stage. And as you develop the field, your uncertainty reduces and it will be very close to what you are going to produce from your field. Okay, so the recovery factor, we said that how much you are going to recover and stuff like that. Usually, a thumb rule is in oil the field, the recovery is typically from 10 to 60 percent. A good field with a good reservoir, good clean sand, good porosity permeability, you can have 60 percent. A tight sand. Uh, horrible uh, looking um, uh, faces like um, uh, tidal channels and stuff like that. They come in and go, a lot of shaliness in there. It's only 10% you can. Whereas gas recoveries are really good. From 50 to 85%, you can recover. 
okay it all depends on recovery depends on your rock properties as i said and also depends on the fluid properties okay the low viscosity fluid you can recover more and the third one is our own development plan okay so how many wells we are placing how how close are our wells okay if you want to be cost effective and you try to uh, number of you reduce your wells you are not going to recover and also the final one is are you using some enhanced oil recovery pressure support or enhanced recovery techniques enhanced oil recovery is trying to increase the pressure inside the reservoir as the pressure depletes after production so if you use that and like um, putting water injecting water or injecting some polymer into the uh, <coughs> into a field okay into the producing layer the support is established so more and more oil will start coming out so these are the things which uh, uh, drive the recovery factor and ultimately when we know all these things we have to ask about our tiger prospect like should we invest in uh, uh, developing and producing from this prospect what are the questions again we run a production profile and i will understand what we can, how much you can reduce and during in what time okay in 10 years what, what you can turn in 10 years 10 million barrels or 10 years 100 million barrels so well, how much money capital cost and operating cost are required okay what will be the future of oil price prediction so if your capex and opex are very high and you you think that future oil price is going to drop okay so this may not work okay and also the company's uh, your investment criteria where in the company's portfolio your particular discovery is fitting that is going to tell us whether the company is going to invest or not okay a typical cash flow for a company it looks like this initially exploration is spending okay the small amount of money but cumulatively it becomes bigger and bigger as more exploration takes place and you have got appraisal taking place so you have got development wells taking place so company is spending a lot of money there is a negative cash flow no cash flow is only investment and you start putting it on production initially you start getting returns okay when you start getting more and more returns the company has to pay taxes and the government take starts increasing so the total profit what company is going to make the green one has to be subtracted from all the expenses operating costs and the government take okay and the capex and stuff like that so you will be left with annually this black curve this is the profit every year on year you are going to make okay with the field life cycle as the field keeps on producing more and more and it starts getting into a declining phase the production starts dropping your profit starts dropping so you make a good profit in initial years and the profit slowly starts dropping because operating expenses are increasing so you need a lot of water injection a lot of polymer stuff okay pressure maintenance stuff like that so there is a time which comes in where your profits are eroded and you may go into a negative so that is where it is called as a economical limit of this particular field so every company has its own economical limit it can abandon much before that if you start producing lot of water with your oil you are not able to dispose your water you are not able to treat government has got restrictions on environment stuff like that your economic limit of producing from a field comes much much earlier than what is shown on this curve okay and this is a just an example of many indian example in rajasthan a mangala field in barmer basin okay how it is done so this is a structure map and this is a static model reservoir model for production okay you have water here in blue and all this brown is our oil, oil area so the oil water contract is around 960 so how we are producing the wells are drilled some are inclined wells like this and some are vertical wells oil produce oil comes up to the surface it goes to a separator it is heated and the gas is recovered from that and the oil which is separated from the gas is goes it goes to the storage and goes into the pipeline okay so and that sent in the pipeline and because we are producing oil there is a pressure drop so they from the right from day number 1 the water injector are put there we are injecting water so the amount of oil is produced the amount of water is going is injected to maintain the pressure so that the sweep of oil is very systematic so where you get the water from to inject it so there is an another formation in subsurface which is called as tumbli formation okay this is a pure water reservoir shallow areas of tumbli in barmer basin lot of drink, drinking water facility you are not supposed to use tap this drinking water in shallow so what you have to do go deep a kilometer deep nobody is going to drill a kilometer for drinking water so that particular water is not going to be used by anybody so we can use it there are number of wells drilled to pump this water from the surface subsurface use that treat it okay filter it take out the chemicals heat it and pump it into the subsurface 
and increase the pressure so that the uh, oil production systematically takes place and that's it i think i will skip on the artificial intelligence because we are running short of time we started a bit late it's already one o'clock okay uh, some some other time about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning uh, we'll discuss about that so i had a couple of slides so that's uh, all good for today thank you very much thank you very much sir for uh, such elaborative and uh, very uh, detailed uh, uh, description of uh, fundamentals of oil and natural gas exploration the way i see it there is a lot of similarities between mineral and uh, you know the uh, similarities in the fundamentals of exploration in uh, mineral and oil fields yes. only thing is uh, the geological structures we are looking is different that is uh, yes. only one <laughs> fundamental uh, variation i believe correct so uh, yes. participants uh, any questions if you have you can uh, Unmute yourself and ask. And there are some questions. Uh, there is one question in the chat box, sir. Uh, is the cable laid on bottom or attached to tail of the ship? I think this is the interaction with particular slide. Oh yeah, correct. Okay. So in seismic acquisition, so ocean bottom cable. So the receivers are at the cable. So the earlier technology was if you want, if you have a data cable connected. Okay, you can go and tie it and acquire data. Nowadays, there is a there are transmitters, so you can simply download it from that. Okay, so data from individual uh, receivers, whether it is on land or offshore, you can straight away download. The signal can come to transmitters, so it can keep on transmitting in uh, real time to the ship. Okay, ship computers, or it is stored in the um, uh, unit there. Uh, and it can be downloaded by a signal which is set so then it starts transmitting so both ways it can work yeah that answers justin john's question i suppose and uh, any questions from the participants you can ask uh, this presentation will be made available uh, uh, on the facebook page the link uh, will be made available in the facebook page of uh, canadic university geology association Okay. And also, it will be uh, if if uh, Srinivas sir permits, I will upload this on the YouTube also. Oh yeah, you're free to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the presentation will be available on YouTube also. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, yeah. I I thank uh, uh, Srinivas sir for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, there is one more. Uh, what is the role of oil exploration in the future? As we are now looking for alternative sources of energy yeah that is very relevant question i suppose very, very good question <laughs> i think um, palakshi you want to answer that you can you can do that go 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 ahead go ahead see it is a very tricky question so a lot of uh, the same research and lot of already alternate source of energy they will be available now cleaner energy alternatives are coming up in the market but there are certain sectors okay still they have to need uh, this particular fuel energy uh, for a longer time to go and number of countries maybe west they can suddenly in the next 10 years okay they can reduce the dependency on um, fuel energy to a considerable uh, <coughs> amount whereas the developing countries as well as um, uh, un underdeveloped countries okay they have a long way to go even by 2040 just a couple of days back i was discussing with palakshi about it india itself uh, but 2040 okay till 2040 the demand for um, fuel energy is not going to decrease for india okay only beyond 2040 so th there will be a, a, a lesser demand but it will be there it will continue to be there because there are many sectors still dependent uh, and they cannot be replaced by um, alternate energies okay so i think probably another generation another 30 40 years maybe let's let's say uh, that is a very very pessimistic of uh, the thing I'm, i'm talking about Okay, so it is. You know, th there is a scope for uh, oil industry to um, flourish and uh, make money and a uh, lot of employment opportunities. At least for till the fifty. Uh, we take two thousand fifty. But even beyond two thousand fifty, these wells, this this technology, this knowledge is going to be used. Okay, so many many wells can just simply get converted into geothermal. Okay, all these oil wells, all these water pump, uh, pump, so they can simply be by use of some technology which is there in uh, the thing, uh, 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 nascent stage. You can many of them can be converted into geothermal uh, the things and um, uh, use, and of uh, of course offshore installations they can be converted into wind energy. But companies are going to stay. These 
in uh, oil and gas companies are slowly naming themselves as energy companies nowadays okay so if you are working there you continue to work there so your only thing is slowly your uh, the same your uh, um, work profile will is going to change transition beyond 2050 into energy uh, knowledge base Right. For us, uh, what I, I I believe, or I I uh, my understanding goes, oil industry is a mammoth of an industry, and uh, I think uh, the alternative energy or alternative sources of energy, like uh, what we have, what we are looking for, India especially like electrical energy. So that is primarily you know primarily used for uh, like domestic purpose and uh, transportation infrastructure something like that. Yeah. But uh, major industries. Uh, runs on oil at least for a uh, uh, couple of decades from now yes, on. Yes, correct. Uh, yeah. Yes, I yeah, agree. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, alternative sources of energy is just a backup plan in case the oil gets completely exhausted, something like that. So that is what uh, I my understanding goes. <laughs> Adding to uh, what you know, there is a, there is lot of oil. Okay, there is lot of oil <laughs> underneath, so it will not uh, any sooner is going to get exhausted. Yes, yes so, sir. Actually, uh, whenever I start my exploration class, uh, I always uh, begin with that statement because in 1970s, uh, people had this strange belief that oil is going to completely exhaust, and they started looking for different uh, uh, sources. But as the technology in the exploration progressed, they they discovered so much oil, or in, uh, even if, in, when it comes to minerals, they have discovered so much mineral deposits as the technology progressed. So people now believe that there is no end for uh, resources. Only thing is, we have to use it judiciously. That's correct. That, 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 That's correct. That is, yeah, correct. That, that, that is what uh, the, the world has come to. And uh, the same person has asked, uh, how can geophysics help for looking for alternative sources of energy? Oh, this is this is a very very interesting um, question. Okay. The alternate source, this geophysics, subsurface geophysics, if you are trying to look at. Okay, this is not going to give a direct. The only indirect uh, evidences will be geophysics is heat measurements. Okay, if you want to use heat measurements for geothermal, lot of geophysical activity is uh, the same. So you know that the hot spot areas or uh, the spring areas where the the heat coming from the earth, okay, is higher. It is not uni uniform all over the world. So this is, I think, fundamentally everybody knows about that. If you can map that. Uh, so that is going to help your uh, uh, your uh, hydrothermal. Uh, the other one is subsurface. I don't find you can use geophysics for carbon capturing. Okay, already we are doing it now. Okay, there are a lot of carbon capturing and pumping it underground. There is oil storage, gas storage, uh, pumping uh, underground. We are to, we are doing it. The same knowledge base we can use it for capturing carbon and then putting it down in the underground so that is another area where we can look and use this geophysical uh, knowledge of subsurface uh, there are a couple of uh, more uh, stuff but on the surface for alternate uh, like so if you want you are looking at solar or wind and uh, that is completely a different ball game altogether so this this geo that also is geophysics it will help but that is not this geophysics yeah for uh, for for both the questions said together, I think I'll add up maybe one or two. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Other dimension. I think most of us, uh, I think uh, la my, our last webinar on uh, 26th of November was the same subject. What the oil industry is going to be and how the alternate industries are coming up. See, we are going to have more alternate resources like solar and wind, no doubt, because we have to go for the carbon management as per our Paris Agreement about 30 to 35 percent CO2 emission would need to cut. But India is a different ball game because carbon emission mostly comes from burning of coal and oil, not gas. OK, so that coal and oil we need to reduce because we cannot uh, come out of all that. There is a very big conference done for two weeks, about 190 countries coming together. Having said, having said that, our coal production is going to be doubled still by 2042. That is our internal uh, uh, planning from our Niti Aayog. But we need to cut down the carbon emission. How it can be done? You are increasing the production, your con consumption is going to be double. But what government is doing, they are retiring the old thermal plants where coal is being burnt, which are not efficient. 
which they give a lot of carbon. Those world's old thermal plants and bringing the new efficient plants, straight away about 20% of the carbon emission is reduced. So that is why the government is working on that and it is implemented also. So there is, the, is optimization you have to do. Definitely oil is going to be less and less in future and gas is going to increase because gas CO2 emission is less. But in India, we are going to have oil also still. We are not going to cut down all. It's very less, about 87% we are importing, but still we are going to be on that. But another uh, controlling factor is we need to have about 40% of our electricity generation by alternate resources. What do we mean by alternate resources? They are again solar and wind. With the time, the energy producing cost of the solar has come down drastically. During last 40 years, about 99% reduction of the cost of production has come down. That means solar is going to solar and wind, they are going to compete with the gas that is the cheapest. But what is the role? Is, is the threat for the geologists? Because if there is no coal or uh, oil or gas with time, if only the solar and wind are going to come up, is it a threat for the geologist? No. Why we say no? Because even for solar to survive, we need a lot of rare earth minerals like lithium. Okay. At present, India is, I think, third or fourth position and China is leading. But we need to do a lot in India, coming together, putting all our heads together to find out more rare earths like lithium and those things, which again, the second question brings there, where our geophysics can help us. Yes, geophysics separately, uh, 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 we can really help in that finding out those minerals also because we know the genesis of all these rare earths are also the thermal melt, a low temperature melt has to come to the surface and it has to come through the deep rooted faults only like Amberdonger carbonatites. There are low pressure, less than 600-500 degree centigrade melts. So probably the deep seated faults which in oil industry already mapped, we can again go back and look at all those things. So the search that the, the geologist needs to support finding more rare earths, more lithium and the more infrastructure for the solar because on wind you need to need to have a lot of steel and cement. So our job is suppose if you want to convert as and today all the energy from the renewable you cannot do it because our industry our steel and cement industry cannot support that transformation so with the time we have a lot of uh, still uh, 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 what i should say a lot of things to be addressed by geologists so it is a very challenging job still waiting for us okay that's what i wanted to add yeah, it's a great stuff. Like you have put a lot of potential coming into mineral industry now, mineral exploration. Okay, so it is. Yeah, no, it's the geothermal. It is still a, still a frontier. Yes. Geothermal is where we, we have been talking up from last 50, 60 years, but still it is a frontier in India. Nothing has come out, but a lot of maybe another 5 to 10 percent of energy resource it can uh, pitch in if you develop yes. it. Uh, we have uh, one more last question that is uh, methane hydrate can re methane hydrate replace the oil okay uh, hydrate uh, yes see hydrate is a source of your gas so it can uh, like um, replacement of oil and uh, gas is in the different forms okay right from associated gas dissolved gas to standalone gas uh, component to biogenic gas and then gas hydrates, then you have got shale gas now. So the requirement of total gas in the in the in the world, okay, is supported by different type of these gases. So your uh, hydrate becomes a part of it. Technology is not even strong today, okay, to just develop and then try to produce it. Everybody try to jump into hydrate uh, projects, including India. Okay, there are certain pilot projects and um, some um, uh, production taking place, but actually very little is being produced from the hydrates, but more from the gas below the hydrates. 
the whatever production is taking place that is very small one but yes that one particular resource will be available in case there is a lot of demand which is going to come up in future for gas we can definitely exploit uh, that hydrate uh, but right now today gas hydrate performs a very very small one and i think indian uh, gas hydrate project is already shelved i think they did all a couple of uh, years uh, work on that and nothing else uh, came out and um, i don't i have not seen the final report what the government said on gas hydrates now yeah yeah you you're right you know a lot of things have been done by, especially in the west coast lot of course mm. and lot of assessment has been done as you said rightly it is a production issue production issues production is going on only lab scale still yes. whatever they have done but coming to industrial scale it takes a lot of uh, time and uh, money so everything is money here if the production cost is very huge nobody is going to buy that so some some production is get from the thermofrost uh, regions from the onland areas not from the off yeah, yeah, yeah that is very small so that yeah. too probably i think it is just because we are below the thermofrost Thermoplast otherwise yeah. expansion will collapse all this uh, hydrate per okay, ice sheet and stuff like that so, yeah yes and another another source of methane is the shale gas as you said uh, uh, shale gas will have all uh, even higher hydrocarbon also correct but uh, mostly c1 and uh, still india is though they have done lot of uh, beginning is very good but still we need to move ahead maybe we can talk on that maybe later mm, yes so uh, there are some more questions uh, yeah. what is your opinion on sub basalt oil or gas prospects in konkan kerala basin of ratnagiri etc and shelf region oh okay this is very interesting see kerala konkan was very close to my heart okay the, i think in year 2000 we came very very close to produce from uh, hydrocarbon from uh, the uh, one particular well that was of course it was a biogenic um, uh, gas the issue with um, uh, kerala konkan basin evolution Okay, so it is a sub basalt hydrocarbon is the question which you are asking. Okay, so we are trying to look at sub basalt means the basalt which is a Deccan basalt equivalent, Cretaceous tertiary boundary basalt, a Riverian hotspot basalt. Below that, in Kerala Konkan Basin, marginally there is a very very small part of the Cretaceous Basin is left. Okay, when the Madagascar separated from India, a part of uh, the basin, a tiny basin of um, uh, Cretaceous, late Cretaceous. Uh, maybe it is uh, early Cretaceous also possible, but uh, we have not penetrated anywhere. Nor in the seismic we see the clear uh, information about that. But late Cretaceous uh, sediment wells have been drilled in Kerala Konkan Basin, especially around um, offshore of uh, Kerala. Okay, so which has penetrated uh, some uh, late Cretaceous um, uh, sandy sequence, arenaceous sequence. Source rock was missing there, so that becomes a primary issue. Do does that particular sequence below the basalt, the Iranian basalt, have the source rock which is required to generate it? So the source, it is in the oil window definitely. Some places it is still in the oil window. Some places it has gone into gas window, the deeper uh, the se uh, section. But if it doesn't have a potential, there is no good quality source rock. Even if you he keep heating it, it is not going to generate. So the indications were very very feeble in the drill wells, so three or four wells, whatever they have been penetrated. that is reason the sub basalt potential is still a question mark we are not trying to rule out it is not there nobody can give a bold statement like it is not there at all okay so we have not got enough evidence or confidence building data to say that there is hydrocarbon charge and migration and it can be chased and produced in the in the kerala component basin yeah, yeah uh, But uh, just a minute, uh, Chandan. One minute. Yeah, please go ahead. Because uh, the sub salt, uh, sub basalt uh, prospects. Uh, as a country, if you look at yes, if you move further on the same west coast, go to Kutch offshore. Recently, now he has discovered lot of gas below the basalts. Okay, they have drilled a basalt as thick as two point two two kilometers of basalt they have drilled, and below that there's lot of some gas. Uh, has been discovered and uh, little bit of oil also so maybe i think it is going to be one of the next uh, hydrocarbon producing basins maybe within a few months or years so there is a hydrocarbon potential below basalts in the kutch offshore not in the uh, kerala is a, is a still long way to go as uh, my friend sir was put it Academics can take uh, a view on this. See where we have fallen. Okay, the, 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 
the industry has failed industry is not strong in putting up the plate reconstruction especially on the west coast of india i was part of a margin um, inter margin and margin workshops okay which is a global uh, workshop for understanding continental markets the the fit of madagascar to india and the basin in between which is uh, after break up which is uh, again further uh, altered by the reunion economics if this particular story is properly reconstructed the fittings are properly established where exactly it can happen how much of continental stretching has taken place okay on the west coast in the southern part where the kerala konkan place present present the kerala konkan i think that is going to open up okay the new in, uh, insight into uh, some research reconstruction research will definitely help in uh, uh, okay working out the potential yeah yeah uh, so we, we have one more question sir uh, yeah. uh, as murali krishna asks uh, canada is focusing on oil sands exploration in very aggressive way will it replace deep sea oil exploration with respect to exploration cost and yeah. does oil sands got to uh, get future as geologists say it is world's difficult oil yes the final the last statement was the most correct statement it is the most difficult oil to say you have to put all sorts of things uh, steam and stuff like that to get oil out of this oil sands okay there was one slide about the cost of uh, per barrel oil in which this oil sands became almost into the extreme cost effective whereas the deep water uh, the same thing, uh, oil okay it doesn't cost that much deep water oil can cost you between 40 to 50 sometimes even uh, 30 to 40 in some places based on the facilities available and near us to the coast but oil sand is not that today canadian uh, oil sands are in very very bad shape they are not able to produce many companies have just left them it is not economical at the current oil uh, rate as yes at 100 dollars per barrel they suddenly become economic and because they are, they are on the surface is it is as good as mining there you are you are mining and uh, extracting it it starts becoming economical but at a lower uh, the, the market value of uh, per barrel uh, this oil they are not cost effective yeah and they will never cost yeah uh, yeah the, 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 that's right it is again a technology because uh, i have been there many times and uh, look at lot of uh, industry and data there for our acquisitions currently the way they produce is that is called a steam assisted gravity drainage they pump a lot of uh, steam uh, into the reservoirs so that that, that the, the thick coil will melt and come out but one no, what they are doing if they can heat up the same reservoir by putting the electrodes so that if their technology breakthrough comes if they can bring down the cost of the production it may come otherwise it is a, a really difficult industry right now okay. yeah i hope all the questions are answered now so we'll end the session sir yes definitely i think we are we have run past too much on this today <laughs> yeah 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 in fact uh, one of the participants has said it is a very advanced session and uh, yeah they thank us and uh, yeah I, i thank you very much sir shiva uh, sir for uh, actually initiating this collaborative uh, webinar and for such a uh, thoughtful collaborative uh, talk and very uh, uh, thought provoking discussions also so thank you very much and i hope i believe that in future also we can uh, uh, yes of course go with uh, collaborative uh, webinars like this uh, maybe in uh, uh, mineral sectors also So definitely. Be, uh, yeah, definitely. yeah, definitely we'll do it. I think we'll uh, pull in some uh, mineral expert exploration ex uh, experts and try to put them here so that uh, yeah. Even and also, the... we may need some experts on uh, laws uh, governing these uh, exploration activities in the country. So that is uh, also very much uh, important Correct. for yes, students, yes. from French point of view. Okay. Yeah. So, I think, um, for can, oil industry can, laws yes i think there are a couple of people who can help but for mineral laws and stuff like that we have to rope in okay so yes 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 we mm. have to find some people we will uh, we will definitely do it sir uh, one uh, one market. thing we should do it on uh, coal, coal exploration still pending yeah <laughs> that is also one thing coal exploration somebody is working uh, on uh, 
Shripal Budhavi was working in Kohl, I think Kohl India or something like that. He was supposed to give a lecture, then he backed out. Okay, so that's the reason there was a void created earlier. So, so we have to contact him and ask if he is now ready to give a coal exploration. Otherwise, I can talk to some people in mineral exploration, some contacts. So try to get in some retired people who work yeah, in yeah, coal yeah. India. So, yeah, so yeah no, no, find out if, if he can do it's fine. Otherwise, you can ask uh, our coal India friends. Yeah. They can always... Uh, that would be really great, sir. That would be really, really beneficial for uh, no, that can, that can be, students. That, that, that yeah. can be done at any time. No, but people are there who just uh, they are retiring our best, our friends. Somebody mm -hmm. can help. Mm -hmm. We will we'll plan it. We will plan it and we will circulate uh, the information yeah. to the participants. Mm -hmm. sure. So I thank you all the thank participants. Uh, I think now there are only 15 remaining as yes, of now. So yeah. I thank yeah. you and all yeah. those who have left. <laughs> uh, we'll we'll meet again once again uh, in the coming Thank you very days. much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, very much. thank you very much. Okay. okay thank, thank you, you. Sinemas. Good. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. The long journey from beginning to the yes. high art stage also. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Chalo, then uh, there was, was there uh, the same. There was somebody who wanted na KCD. This thing I, I had asked him to uh, contact or uh, come on the speak to us. KCD wanted to hold some uh, this thing webinar. Sir, uh, hey, uh, you, you want to log out, so okay, you can log out. I will just join with the uh, Palaxi or phone. Yeah, yeah, sure, okay, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. sure, sure. Get it.